know if you would wait and start in half an hour. I think you would probably just wait in this forum here, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and see what happens. And if nobody, you know, if we can't get it going, then um, we'll give up. We'll, we'll say. All right. So I see Janet. She's actually calling in. So I'm going to try to move her over. There's Janet. Yep. Is that yep. the phone number I see? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Janet, uh, can you unmute yourself and tell you tell us that you hear us? Does someone have to unmute her? I just clicked ask to unmute. unmute. Yeah. Janet. So for all you attendees who are in the public attendees uh, area, uh, we're trying to connect with our fourth member for attendance this evening, which would mean we have a quorum and would mean we can proceed with the meeting. Chris, did she respond to your text? She said um, yes, that she was in the attendees and she gave me her phone number, yeah. which we know, and we know she's yeah. here, but she just can't seem to unmute herself. Pam, I'm still seeing her in the attendees list. Which should she move over to the panelist list if you move her? I'm not getting that option, and I'm wondering. Try star nine, Janet, not star six. Star I nine is what you do, right, Pam? Uh, yes. Hmm. So this is strange because um, I believe Andrew called in last, last go round and I just gave him the permission to talk and he came over in the same way that Janet has come over into the panelists. Um, but I'm not sure, asked to unmute. Maybe she should go out and come back in again. Asked to unmute, I mean, Janet, you could try that. I think Pam Rooney had a similar problem one time and she went out and came back in and she was able to connect. I think she just left. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I can keep watching for her. Well, should I go ahead and read the preamble and or, or we don't even wanna go that far without a quorum? I don't think we should go that far without a quorum. Okay. I think there was one some one point maybe last summer or the summer before where there were only a couple of us and we just opened it and continued it and mm -hmm. then closed it. So mm -hmm. yep, we might have to do that this time. Is a recording in progress? I heard that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. This is all yes. being memorialized for future anthropologists to okay. analyze. There's Janet again, and it doesn't uh, look like she's muted. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Janet, can you speak? I'm told that I'm unmuted, finally. Yes. yes. There you go. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, Janet, you are our fourth member. So we have a quorum for this evening. And uh, will you be on the phone all evening rather than on your computer? Well, I'm having trouble logging into the meeting, so I'm trying to do that now. And in I some for some reason I couldn't um, get to our you know 
our, our network. And so my husband's trying to do that now, but um, I'm kind of, I'm wondering if I can try to do a zoom on my phone. Um, Cause I'm not going to be able to really see anything. And it's kind of a um, document or map heavy thing. So I could, I'm, I'm afraid to leave though. <laughs> Cause I want to be able to do what I can. Well, why don't you stay on your phone until you see if your husband can help connect your network? You can it's watch it on good. television. Okay. Janet, watch it on television. Okay. Oh, that's a good idea. It's, okay. I you think can... we might be go, but why don't we, why don't we start and I, I will find something to make this work somehow. All right. I'll do it, I'll do it either on my computer or. Or get your video from the TV. Channel 17. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll go ahead with the preamble. Yes. Thank you for waiting. I'm sorry about this. Well, we, we've, we have to have you in order to meet. Okay, so welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 15th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.44 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Maria Chow. Here. Jack Jemsek. Here. Uh, we know that Tom Long is absent, and we believe that Andrew McDougall will be late or entirely absent. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Uh, Janet McGowan. Here. Thank you. And Johanna Newman is absent. So we have four members present, uh, four out of seven, which is a quorum for this evening's meeting. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our agenda now at 6.48 is approval of minutes. We have the minutes from our last meeting ready to be reviewed and approved. Uh, that was on June 1st. Uh, board members, do you have any comments on these minutes? Uh, and I'll stop there for the moment. 
Okay, I'm not seeing any hands for for editing or comments on the minutes. <clears throat> In that case, uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes as drafted by Chris and Pam? Maria. I move we approve the minutes as drafted by Chris and Pam. Thank you, Maria. And Jack? Second, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll have a roll call unless there's other comments. All right. Um, starting with you, Maria. Proof. Thank you. And Jack? Proof. Um, Janet? Approve. And I'm an approve as well. So that's four members in favor and three absent. Okay, the time is 649 and we'll go on to public comment period. And I will repeat uh, what I said a moment ago. Uh, if you have comments on items which on our are on our agenda, listed on our agenda, please hold your comments until we get to that item. We will request public comments at that time. So at this time, are there any public comments on items which have not been listed on our agenda? I do not see any public comment, uh, any ra hands raised for this public comment opportunity. Okay, so the time now is 6.50 and we will move on to the next uh, item on our agenda, which is item number three, a public hearing for site plan review and special permit, which has been continued from May 18th, 2022. So the time is 6.50. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2022-14 and SPP 2022-05. This is regards Center East LLC-446 uh, to 462 Main Street, request site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 17,000 square foot 27 unit residential mixed use building, including three affordable units with site lighting and landscaping, and to request a modification of the total number of parking spaces required for the mixed use building under sections seven and 7.9 of the zoning bylaw and seek small car parking under section 7.104 of the zoning bylaw to co-locate with the existing mixed use building known as 446 Main Street and the mixed use building known as 462 Main Street, uh, which was authorized by Site Plan Review 2020-01 and Site Plan Review 2020-05 and any subsequent amendments, and request a special permit to extinguish all special permits associated with parcel 14B-66. And that is all in the, in the BN zoning district on map 14B. Okay, uh, any new board member disclosures of the few members who are at, you know, present this evening? Don't see any. Uh, Mr. Reedy, I'll turn the floor over to you for this uh, revised or, or the presentation this evening. Perfect. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, okay. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon, Wilson and Amherst, here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Center East, John Robleski and his applications, plural, as the chairman noted. Uh, with me this evening, John Robleski, uh, Rachel Stevens, architect, Mike Lou, uh, site designer. And so um, maybe a little bit of context. We were here May 18th. We got a lot of great feedback. Uh, John went back and, and with his professionals redesigned um, some of the project uh, based on some of the comments, uh, put words in John's mouth, but I think we're still in the midst of, of redesign. I think he's, you know, as of today had some, and I don't know if, if the expectation is to, 
close and vote tonight. I think it's probably a continuation to the June 29th meeting ultimately, but I think it's worth a conversation about the, the site changes and then probably um, uh, about the parking and the parking waivers and some of the data that John has, has got. So you know, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike uh, to have him. Mike, if, you're, if you can share your screen, maybe walk through some of the site changes. And you're muted, Mike, in case you're gonna talk. Okay, let me get caught up here. But oops, let's see. We can now hear you. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna share. Whoops. And that's your. There you go. Okay, you got the rendering. Um, so there's been some back and forth today, this afternoon. This um, rendering represents. Let me see. I've got to try to pan over here. Uh, that's weird. Huh. All right. Anyway, um, there's been there was some back and forth today, and I think we're, we're still like Tom mentioned in the midst of some modifications, but this rendering uh, more or less represents uh, changes from the initial submission for the site plan. And I will just highlight the major um, uh, things that were changed is that the new building, this L-shaped building here in the center was pushed back or pushed further to the north away from the existing building at 446 Main Street. Um, I believe initially it was a 13 foot setback from this main wall here and 13 foot setback from the east wall on this wing here. Um, now this is a, a 20 foot distance to the new building. The distance from this kind of like shed entry vestibule uh, and the new building is 12.2 feet. And we, we did move this, the new building over one foot to the east. So the setback is 14 feet from the east um, end of the existing building here. Um, this essentially squeezed this northern portion so that we, we basically changed the parking to an angled and one way exiting the site. Um, we, didn't, we felt we didn't have enough room to do 90 degree parking and a proper um, aisle width um, so this is basically 48 feet wide. These are all uh, proposed compact spaces, 16 feet deep, a 16 foot one way lane and another 16 foot um, deep uh, parking um, bay. So 48 feet total of pavement. It did shrink from um, the original uh, layout, obviously, a little bit narrower. Um, there's still 47 parking spaces proposed. Again, these are all compact spaces. These are um, existing compact spaces in the existing lot. Um, we did add, we, we put the, um, we had located the uh, accessible parking space here at the south. There were, there are three existing spaces here. Um, these need to get repaved. So we added one space down here. Um, we did end up losing a space out of this area. So we moved it down here. Right now, um, I, I, these are labeled as full size spaces, nine feet wide, 18 feet deep. Um, it, it, you know, it did push it closer to the Main Street sidewalk, um, adding that one space and then increasing the width to nine feet. Um, we hadn't, John and I hadn't really talked about that, but we, you know, I feel that, we, you know, with the um, request for a waiver um, on the parking requirements and this and the dimensional size, um, if we can make these compact spaces, we can push that back a little bit, give the sign a little bit more kind of room to breathe. Um, but uh, I think right now we're at 20, 26 or 27 compact spaces out of the total 47. Um, I have another exhibit that shows some um, gathering, outdoor gathering spaces, but you know, basically you can see in the rendering all the green space around the buildings and parking are um, lawn areas. Obviously, we've got the, um, um, whoops, gosh, I don't know why. I, for some reason, I can't pan. Huh. 
Um, we've got the um, a 20 foot wide yard in the back, and this kind of blends with the um, development here at High Street. It's all grass here, but basically the, this is you know essentially private. You know, I think of it as private yard space for the first uh, for the ground floor dwellers in this building. Um, there's a really kind of a nice green space up here to the north of the parking area that could be utilized. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, we we do want to keep the um, the the southern lawn space uh, at Main Street open and not change its character. Um, we are putting the underground detention basin here. It's it's about the only place it can go on the site where it won't um, disrupt the existing trees, uh, where we have the proper clearance to high groundwater. Um, so this area is going to be disturbed, but restored as lawn. Um, and uh, we can talk about gathering spaces um, later if, 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 you know, if and when that's a, a proper time. I don't know if you want to maybe go through that now or, um, I, I'm, you know, we don't, we don't really have a format set for this presentation, but maybe I could touch on all of the site um, issues. And then, you know, John can, um, has, has some, uh, a presentation and some figures and stuff about parking. And then I'm sure Rachel has some updates on the building um, and the design and, and um, um, of, of the building and color scheme. So um, let me just, let me do jump over to um, that plan exhibit here. Uh. Again, okay. I apologize if this is a little bit hard to see. Hold on. So basically what this plan shows is some proposed uh, changes to the plan. And again, this is in progress, but it's highlighting existing lawn spaces. I mentioned here in the back of existing uh, Center East building phase one, I guess we're calling it, there's the open lawn space above the existing um, uh, underground detention basin here at this kind of southeast corner. Um, this red line indicates at adding two, I, I guess it's referred to as shadow parking. Um, I understand that these were uh, proposed uh, shadow parking spaces with the original project for Center East. Um, obviously, they can still um, accommodate space there. I've highlighted this as an open lawn area. Um, with some stone benches here. Uh, we are proposing to do a small paved patio gathering space kind of centrally located between uh, 446, the existing building and the new L-shaped building here. Um, this would kind of provide a, a nice um, central uh, usable kind of gathering space uh, with, um, I understand that there's some granite um, um, coping that's been salvaged from the uh, demolition of the existing building that used to be in this area. Uh, it would be wonderful to be able to use that material on site for all, all or any of the benches or gathering spaces. Um, we're so we're, you know, we have either one or two benches in this area. Um, there's, you know, some additional areas where we can put benches under some mature trees. Um, so again, the patio, there's grass here in, in the uh, main and Gray Street corner. There's grass lawn in the southern part of the site. There's existing grass lawn here for people to kind of sit out. Um, again, there's private space and then our more private uh, uh, lawn space in the rear of this building. And then a nice gathering space here, which could be grass. It, it, you know, it, it could accommodate a small patio up there as well. Um, further, this plan also shows there was some um, comment about wanting to know where the um, air conditioning units would be located. These little orange rectangles represent um, blocks or, or concrete pads, which would house these small um, uh, air, uh, air handling units. Um, they are stackable. But really, they're they're kind of like a suitcase size if you've seen those, um, and they're quite efficient and quiet. Actually, we've seen these installed on a lot of um, housing apartment type uh, projects um, that we've worked on throughout the valley. They basically can sit on either um, 
um, even patio blocks set on the ground. Some of them are, are on metal um, legs, uh, stackable, as I mentioned, but there's, lo there's um, a set to be located, you know, along this wall of the new building, the south wall here, uh, north, and then a couple on the north wall. Um, and I hope you can see that. I'll blow it up just a little bit, but again, I'm having trouble. I don't know why I can't pan. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, well, anyway, I hope you can see those and 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 uh, make out um, what we're trying to show on this plan. Ugh, this is very frustrating for some reason. Oh, there we go. Now I've got it. Um, so those are some things that um, you know we're willing to uh, um, provide. Uh, as additions to the plan for gathering um, spaces or, or to have more formal gathering spaces. Um, this widened space is suitable for people to sit and gather. We, we, are, we also are indicating some screen plantings here at the corners of the two buildings. We don't want to create a solid wall or fence or solid wall of, um, of uh, like a hedge because that, that might invite people to kind of like, you know, hang out there and, and you know, we don't want people um, entering the site and, and, you know, looking in the windows and things of the apartments there. So we, you know, we do have some um, ever, or, you know, maybe our providers proposed here that would provide, you know, a little bit of screening, but still allow uh, an open uh, view into that space um, just to keep it more, you know, allow it to be more safe, um, I think is the way what we would like to uh, maintain so that there's visibility into that space. Um, from that side. Um, we've, we've updated, we've also updated the stormwater report, which was submitted to Jason Skeels. I don't believe we've heard any comments back. Um, we, we haven't received any comments back yet. Um, so, you know, we'll have to um, address any concerns that Jason may have, but, um, you know, working, you know, having worked with Jason many, many, many times before, I think that, you know, we have a pretty good rapport and can accommodate um, any, you know, comments, um, concerns that he might have. Um, and I'm sure he'll, he'll find that the, um, calc the stormwater calculations, um, you know, are, are accurate and meet uh, the Massachusetts uh, stormwater regulations. Um, I don't want to take up any more time right now. I guess at this point, I'll invite um, John or Rachel to talk about their respective um, uh, items. Thank you, Mike. You, you, I don't know if you want to come back if you have any questions on the site or do those now. Also, uh, it's up to you guys. Why don't we? Why don't you guys go through your what you okay. want to say tonight, and we'll come back. John, do you want me to present? Rachel, Rachel I think you should probably go. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the renderings? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I agree with Tom Reedy that we got wonderful feedback from the board and we really appreciated it. And we um, have actually been going back and forth with Chris and um, Rob Mora in the town offices as well in the past couple of days and um, getting some more feedback. So this has been really helpful in the process. Um, we have some new renderings for you tonight. I, I believe they went out to the board this afternoon, but I'm not sure if anyone had time to look at them. Um, and we're looking at reducing the volume of the building on the south Main Street side of the building um, to two stories, similar to the, um, the approach at phase one at Center East Commons. Um, it's still a three-story building in the bulk of the building, but at the Main Street level, um, it mirrors the two-story look of that streetscape. And um, that also changes the relationship of the buildings to each other. I also really loved uh, Doug's comment of um, suggesting that we paint the existing building to match the color scheme so that it all blends in as one complex. I think that really helps a lot. Um, so we have Photoshop painted it for now. Good luck to whoever is in charge of painting over that dark red trim. And um, we are looking at a couple of other views here where you can see the two-story buildings that march down Main Street and the three-story buildings behind them. 
Um, and you can see that from across the street from the VFW parking lot here. Um, and then we have, you know, a similar view to before with the, um, the three story first phase and the three story second phase um, bookending each other across the parking lots. Um, the other new thing that we have um, that we sent to you a few weeks ago um, was an update on the sign. Um, oh, this is the wrong sign plan, sorry. Uh, we sent an update of the plan so that uh, because the there was some comments so that the sign would look better or more Amherst style. So that other version was a monument sign, monument style sign that was closer to what the Amherst Media had proposed um, next door. But this is something that is closer to the existing sign, a uh, wooden sign on posts. Um, and it's using some graphic language that um, mirrors the gable style of the building um, to bring that into the signage and to welcome people to 462 Main Street on this sign. Um, so, uh, John, I don't know if you want to speak further to the details of this approach, or um, if you want to leave it at this sort of overview for now. This this does reduce the number of units. Um, it's now twenty three units and twenty five bedrooms, um, but um, it's it it gives the whole complex a different view, and so that's the hope is to invest in that look for the for the buildings as a whole. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> we did take the, the comments seriously from a short meeting we had yesterday. I, the, after the, the uh, May meeting, we kind of got the impression we they kind of wanted it to look a little more like 446, not necessarily width wise or height wise, but just in general appearance. So that's why we submitted the uh, the first rendering. But yeah, I mean, this is a great look. I think here it blends the whole property together. It ties the corner together, uh, maintains a lot of the screening that's there and the trees in the front and screens the parking. Uh, I think from that parking space in the front, even though we made them uh, nine foot by 18 foot spaces, I think we only added like two or three feet to the actual width and it's still like 12 feet off of the property line in the front, which is more than the uh, 10 foot setback required in the BN zone. And then regarding the parking along uh, the north end there where we made it one way, you know, my thinking there was everybody's looking for 462 Main Street, so you're driving up or down Main Street. So now we have a nice sign with the street number on it that applies to all three buildings, and they drive into the Main Street driveway. And then once they're in there and want to leave, they have an option of going out to Gray Street or back out to Main Street. I think that just makes the flow a lot better and keeps it far enough away from the neighbor to the north of the parking lot who requested that he would rather have parking near his property line. In fact, both the neighbors to the north, we had a meeting in July of last year, I met with them on their deck and asked them specifically, you know, would you rather have a building fairly close to your property line or parking? And they adamantly said parking. And the butter to the north of the parking lot just requested he have enough room for the landscape crew to trim the hedge. So he's got probably four to six feet all the way along there uh, for trimming the hedge and so forth. So I think in general, the layout of the parking um, works really well for the site. And reducing the building the way we did, went from 27 units to 23 units. Um, we configured a couple areas. We're still kind of working on that for the fine details, but the exterior from what you saw in these uh, renderings, uh, probably not gonna change a whole lot. So looking for the board's comments on that in case you do want some changes and we can certainly work those in before the next meeting. Okay, thank you, John. All right, uh, board members, I'm where this is the time for comments. And uh, at some point this evening, we'll need to decide how we want to leave the conversation this evening and or or whether we want to continue it. 
Maria. Thanks, Doug. Um, thanks to the team for this presentation. Uh, I, I, I'm so thankful that uh, there's like a real great collaboration on um, this because the project I think looks a lot better and looks really like it fits the context um, quite well, actually. Um, so thank you so much for taking you know the comments and getting help from the planning department, building department, because I mean this is exactly how the process. Well, maybe not in some people's minds, but I think that it should work. You know, you, you get a lot of uh, really good designers together and then get input from public and from the um, people at town hall. And um, yeah, I, I think the, the view from the South is just fantastic. And um, um, and I appreciate that you pushed the L-shaped building a little further from the existing building. Um, it's still tight, but it's, you know, or like, you know, in order to get enough parking on the parcel and circulation, it's just, yeah, it's, you know, without tearing down that corner building, <clears throat> existing building, um, it's kind of like the, the very best you could do without just having, you know, inadequate parking. And, um, and with its location so close to town and to bus stops, um, I'm pretty comfortable with the number you've landed on and um, and still providing enough green space um, for the people who will be using that uh, property. So um, yeah, thank you for your uh, effort this last month in, um, in making these improvements. And uh, the only thing I'm not too clear on is exactly the before and after as far as the site work. I do have the, you know, the version in our packet of the architecturals, but not of the landscape. So it's hard to know exactly what has changed other than like the one way aspect and some spaces added here and there. But um, um, right now, nothing jumps out at me as like being like a big problem area. But uh, but yeah, overall, I, I think it, it's working really well with the, um, the scale of the, the neighborhood. So um, yeah, it's, it's great. Thank you, Maria. John, I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure everybody understands that the rendering you're looking at here and the ones that uh, Mike has uh, don't reflect the change to the front of that building. It still shows the old footprint. So just keep that in mind that what you're seeing here is going to be a little bit smaller in the front. Yep. Right. right. Yeah, right in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I uh, concur with Maria. Uh, it looks really, really good uh, from that, from the view from the south. Uh, but I had a question, it, you know, because stormwater, I know there, there, there's no uh, incentive within the Amherst bylaws, but it, are uh, permeable pavers just, you know, I, I think permeable pavement ha has its issues because of clogging, whatever, but uh, permeable pavement or yeah, pavers uh, seem like a decent thing, and I'm just wondering, you know, are you not are you implementing that at all, Mike, uh, in in projects? Um, rarely, <laughs> and you're right. Uh -huh. I mean, they they're, they tend to be more maintenance uh, heavy, especially in this climate where people are putting sand down and stuff. Um, the, the most common uh, method that we've seen are those open grid concrete pavers. Yes. Uh, if you're familiar with the research drive. I well, I'm very familiar with research drive. Okay, okay. Well, that uh, <laughs> building that uh, Mickey Marcus was involved with, I believe has, you know, that type of uh, open grid paving. Yes. I, I believe that's the been the example of a lo the longest permeable paving uh, for parking in town. I don't know how many years it's been in, but it's been close to 20. I know there's some at UMass. We did some at the common school. There is issue, there's obviously issues with getting vegetation to grow in there more likely than not, you're going, you're not going to have lush grass. Um, you will have some vegetation, but it'll be, you know, it will end up being clover or, or weed um, species, a quote unquote weed species. Like my, my, like my lawn? 
<laughs> well, it's <laughs> how much care you want to put in it, into it. Um, the other thing we've seen is actual permeable asphalt. Uh, that's been being used um, a little bit more, but I can't remember what the cost differential is. It's, it's something like four times the cost of just regular asphalt. Yeah. Um, and then you, you know, you have to put in um, uh, like a, a better or a, a deeper layer of crushed stone in there to act as a well, if you will, under yeah. that. So, but both of those obviously can get clogged with fine sediments and, um, you know, it does take vacuuming. It's a new, it's a newer um, uh, way or, or newer way of um, doing maintenance on those or keeping them, you know, free draining. Um, but it is like a brand new um, asphalt, per permeable asphalt patch or whatever. It's quite incredible. You can pour a bucket of water on it and it just disappears. Yeah. But obviously over time, if it gets clogged, you know, you're just, I, I you know, in this climate, I just feel it's, it's, you know, it's not going to last forever. And then what do you do? Peel it up and do it again, you know? So we don't yeah. have any of that on this project, right? Um, no, we're not proposing permeable pavers on this project at all. And I, okay. in fact, um, you know, we did it, it. It just it wasn't considered. Um, yeah. Well, my my observation on Research Drive was like the the permeable pavement was a was a no go. It just with the clogging and the need for the vacuum drive, but the the pavers seemed intriguing and and they're not part of the drive that's just where the parking so they're not overloaded and yeah. uh, it's just something i just wondered if you considered yeah um yeah. yep i mean i've i just went by i just drove through the common school yesterday on my way back from like belcher town to northampton just to take a look and um if you're familiar with the common school the parking spaces around there are heavily used we also use the permeable paver the open grid concrete pavers on an emergency drive that goes up to you know the, the the north side of the school kind of, and there is vegetation growing in those because nobody drives on that or it's rarely driven on. Mm -hmm. um, so that is also an issue. It doesn't it doesn't look great, you know, if you try to grow grass or something there and it's constantly being driven on. It just doesn't survive, um, yeah. or it has a very hard time surviving. It, it eventually will become like weeds. Is my experience. Okay. Anything else, Jack? Uh, nope. All right. Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. So I wanted to note that Janet um, sent me a text saying that she was having trouble hearing. The sound was going in and out. So I wanted to know if others were having that same problem. Janet seems to have her problem uh, corrected. And um, if anyone is having that problem, they can listen to the uh, video of this, which will be posted. I think it'll be posted on Friday. So if people are missing part of the video or part of the sound, they can listen to it um, when the IT department posts it on Friday. Thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. I can say my experience has been that I've been getting consistent audio quality. Yeah. Uh, Janet, did you have any comments on this? Um, yes. Um, so I was wondering if we can go back to um, kind of towards the original screen showing the changes, because I had sort of the same uh, questions or um, about what's changed. And, um, and then just so in terms of the um, kind of alley between um, the old house, the um, north side of the old house to the south side of the um, new building that was as small as five feet and then i think at 12 feet originally and what yeah oh. so janet we're we're losing your audio on that and then what is uh, so try try it again I think it's like i think it's just, just say that sentence again um, I'm wondering what, if you can do the two alleys between the buildings, what the original distances were and what they are now. All right, John. John, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? So John's muted, now oh. you're not. 
Michael, yeah, I think you got those exact measurements. So, so originally, is this your screen we're seeing, John? No. Okay. It's I don't. Rachel's. Oh, um, well, from from the 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 furthest north wall of the existing building, the little shedding, what we what I consider the kind of like shed vestibule, um, to the new building right now is twelve point two feet. And what was it a month ago when we first it, saw this? Uh, it was um, 12.2 minus 7, so it was 5.2. Uh, a little bit less than that. That that shed dormer in the back that houses the uh, ramp and the uh, handicap entrance, uh, that's 7 feet 10 inches. So I think it was somewhere around five feet, two inches or something. Yeah, before. Like, yeah it was five feet and five, about, about that. So... Basically, we increased that distance seven feet. Okay. There's seven feet more uh, space in the north uh, alleyway. And then what about from the east side of the building to the called that, south wing of the new building? Originally, it was 13, and it's it's just moved one foot more to the east, so it's now it's 14 feet. Okay. Some of our thinking on that, just to give you a little background, is um, before we had the gas in the water lines coming in the north end of the building, so to be underneath the parking lot. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah, swung in we, from the north. Yeah, so we looked at that and we were a little bit concerned about if we could move things farther north and give the tenants on the south side of that building uh, more sunlight. Uh, that's a big reason why we did it. And then we were able to run the uh, water and the gas line straight from Gray Street right through that 12 foot area directly into the mechanical room. So it worked out pretty well. And having the gable roof on the north side of uh, the existing building, they do get a lot of sunlight there. And you know, this time of year when the grass has grown, I don't foresee any issues with having some shrubbery back there or lawn area. I think they're gonna get plenty of sunlight just put a different kind of grass seed in there, like a fescue or something. And it gives the area, you know, a nice area for somebody who wants a little private area for sitting out there and just reading or sunbathing or whatever. It's kind of a enclosed area. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more, definitely a more private space. All right, uh, Janet, uh, your hand is still up. Yeah, so um, another, another question, you know, I, I like the idea of putting some greenery there instead of just kind of a gravel. Um, another question I had was about um, um, driving. So the two-way driving. So, and I'm I, to me, it looked like it was just you drive in and you, you drive in on Main Street and you drive out on Gray Street, but the Main Street entrance would still be two-way. And I'm wondering about car movement, like how would a car pulling in turn around and come out. It, it just, everything looks so tight on this site because of the size of the building. Okay, um, Mike, are you, are you assuming that any car that came in and wanted to go out on Main Street pulled into a space and then backed out of that space and came to reverse direction? Right, if, yes. That's correct. Most people would be pulling into a parking space and then obviously doing their maneuver to turn around and head back out when they left the site. If they, if for instance, let's just say all the spaces were full or something and they came in Main Street and went, drove up to the north, they could still do a three point turn or a turnaround by pulling left into that one way lane, then backing out, you know, and then heading back south toward Main Street if they wanted to get out that way. But really, if, if somebody was coming to the site and they decided, oops, I want to, I want to, I need to go, I forgot to go to stop and shop or whatever, and they wanted to get back out, they would just drive through the one way lane and exit on Gray Street, and then get back to Main Street, you know, doing a basically a big um, loop or a horseshoe or whatever. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering, would what would be the downside of just making the main street entrance entry only? Why, 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 what's the big problem with having people exit, everybody exit on, on Gray Street? 
Yeah, I'm thinking that too. John, you want to th think about that? Um, no, not at all. I think um, <laughs> <laughs> the design, you know, that you see on Main Street, that was built according to the the building we did last year. It really had none of these thoughts in mind at the time. So that is properly designed for both entry and exit to and from Main Street. There's enough spaces from the parking area to where the porch actually used to be is right along that curb line. I don't think you can see my cursor, right? No. <laughs> Moving it around thinking you can see it. But anyways, the parking spaces were designed to be used or, and they have been used for almost a year now. There were no issues. I think just having the one way out to Gray Street and the fire department kind of like that too, in case of an emergency, they would certainly come in that way if needed. Um, so it just kind of works out for everybody at this point. But the main street site is the entrance driveway there is 18 feet wide, which is a requirement for two way traffic uh, eager, the driveway. Eager. Um, the exit out to Gray Street now is 16 feet wide, which is actually 10 feet or six feet wider than required. And Mike, I think it's only a 10 foot one way. Yeah, I believe zoning requires a 10 foot egress, 10 foot width on an egress uh, for a one way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the other nice thing about this design is initially we were going to take out one of the nice maple trees that is on the Gray Street property line there. Right. And the way this works out now, it actually fits perfect between the maple trees. Uh, we do lose that stone planter that's there, but that's going to, the stone will be reused somewhere else on site for a little retaining area or whatever. And then we'll have those new post lights there. And I don't know if you want to talk about those quickly, about the question that came up regarding why there's a different type of post light versus what we used on the other site. Um, John, I wonder, can I just um, stay a little bit on the, the traffic circulation? Um, because I was thinking the same thing that Doug was, that having two-way traffic um, in that section might be you know, getting kind of busy for people walking back and forth, like traffic from both directions. And if it just, people entered on Main Street and exited on Gray Street, it'd be sort of sim more simplified for the pedestrians. But also, I, it would I think it would give maybe give you some room to pull the um, the new building a little further away from the little building, which is still kind of dwarfed, in my opinion, dwarfed by the extension and kind of the the new building seemed to sort of crammed in a little bit on the lot. And so I just I would just say consider that for the future you know, if it might give you some more space for the, the building to move the building. It might give a little more simplicity for people walking, not having to look both ways. If you're carrying a bag of groceries, have a crazed toddler or a dog, you know, or you're just a visitor and you're a little confused and, you know, trying to figure out what building. So I, I think it might be simpler just to have it one way. Um, so that's one, one observation. Um, I do like the reduction in the, the front of the new building, because it did um, really, it did reduce um, that feeling of there's like a little building and then there's this really, really big building. I'm not, you know, I would, again, just ask for more um, detail on the new building to kind of match the pretty details or just the, the level of detail on the um, old house. Um, you know, I don't know if it's just changing the siding. So it's, you know, you know, on some parts or a little more detailing on the window. I do still think the new building really kind of dwarfs the um, little, what it doesn't seem like a little house to me when I'm there, but when I look at this picture, it does seem little. Um, the new facade goes a long way to making it more integrated. So um, that was one feeling. I had a question. I mean, I have other questions, but a question about the sign if people have offices, I know they're going to want, you know, businesses are going to want their name on that sign. So, you know, if, when you look across the street, Main Street, there's just, you know, there's a sign that announces the address, but there's a whole, often a whole series of names underneath. So I was wondering if that was part of the um, sign. If, as businesses come in, can they put their name there so they can get some advertising and locate people? There, there could be a separate directory and some you know, at the, at the, but why don't you, John, what was your plan for directing people to different businesses within the complex? 
Well, it kind of works out um, because each of the office spaces are right in the front of each of the three buildings. And the shared parking spaces that we intend to use are all right there in the front, including two handicapped spaces, one being a van accessible. So I think we need nine spaces to be shared with the uh, offices based on the square footage. Uh, that's another thing that we haven't talked about is that office in the front of the new building. Uh, we deleted the studio unit that was in the front there. So now it's all one big office right across the front of mm -hmm. that reduced area. So it's like 620 square feet or something versus 330, I think the other one was. So we have more office space and I think having that is kind of the anchor in that main building uh, all across the front makes it nicer too. But each doorway for the offices will have a sign with a light. And I think that's the personalized properties that you see on the bottom there. It's kind of what we went through with Crossman properties when they were going to go into unit one over at the first building. So there would be a light over the sign area and just identify them. But, you know, there could be enough room, I think, to have just a series of little signs underneath where it says uh, downtown residences and office spaces for like a short, the old sign had that, but it was kind of took up the whole sign and they had separate placards that they just threw it in as the tenants changed. But yeah, that's certainly something to think about. And I think we have enough square footage or I don't know if that qualifies as like a temporary identification uh, for a business or we could actually take out the downtown residences and that little green circle on the bottom and mount something there. So will, will, will each of these three properties have its own street number? No. No, they're all intended to be 462 Main Street. Was, I talked with the fire department on that, and um, in my experience through the years, as far as uh, responding to emergencies, when you enter a, a complex, you're looking for sequential numbers. You know, you don't want to be looking, okay, this building, what number is this building? You know, how come there's one through 20 on that building, one through 20 over here? I think from a public safety standpoint, it makes more sense to have it all sequential. So you see on a door units, you know, six through 20, 21 through whatever, makes it a lot easier, I think, for first responders. So then will the three or however many business suites there are, uh, just be part of that sequential number system? Correct, yeah. So unit one on the building we did last year is the office space there. And I believe the office space in the proposed building will be 26. And then the new building or the existing building, well, these are gonna be renumbered a little bit because we lost four units. Uh, initially, the first floor of, of the now 446 was gonna be unit 54. So that'll probably be unit 50. And then in the house, in the house, it'll continue. You'll have 51, two, three. No, there's only one apartment upstairs in the house. So that probably will be 51. And what, is there a business downstairs in the house? Uh, there's nothing there now. It was pretty much empty when I bought it. And I said, well, it doesn't make sense to try to rent that to a business and have all this construction going on all around it. So that'll be our construction office during construction and uh, see what happens after that. And that's unit 50 that he was talking about. So that would be unit 50 on the first floor for that commercial right. unit. Okay. Unit 50 is on the first floor of the house or of the new building? Of the house of the house oh okay yeah and then the, the unit okay fine yeah they're right they're so it makes it easier for deliveries it, that's, that's fine it's sequential through the whole complex so correct um okay um rachel i see your hand up um, I, I just wanted to point out that because all of the commercial spaces at the front of the main street side of the property here um, I really like having the two-way entry here because then all of the commercial parking can enter and exit from the main street side and leave this whole area for the residences and guests. Um, so I do like how that works out. Um, and 
um, personally having visited the property, it feels it feels really easy to move in and out of that driveway the way it is, even with the behemoth van that I drive right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Janet, your hand is up. So um, just to clarify, because I have so many changes. So on the new, the current new building, you are increasing the office space or not? I mean, I'm looking at a little red um, yeah, I think he said it went from 300 and something to it's now 680 or something. No, that the office unit one is the office space in a building we built last year. That is not changing. That's 550 square feet. Right. Unit 26, where the cursor is now or was, that's going to be all across that new 32 foot uh, front of the building instead of having a studio unit and an office space, it's all office space now. So that'll be about, it's 32 by 21, I think. So a little over 600 square feet. But that's in a new, in the proposed new building. In the current new building. So just like Janet had talked about, okay. So just to, no. to, to give some, I don't know, maybe a hot tip or advice. When I went through the Red Barn, just to look at offices, they have very, very tiny spaces. And um, a lot of them, and uh, you know, a lot of them were rented. I know a fair amount were empty. Um, it looks like there's a lot of people providing either, you know, different kinds of therapy, you know, um, massage therapy, you know, emotional therapy. Right. And the building on the second floor, particularly, but on the first floor, you know, obviously they're having terrible tra traumas with sound. They're not very soundproofed. And there were a lot of um, white noise machines in the hallway and the sound of, I, at one point I thought it sounded like a river was running through one of the halls. And so I, I thought that if, you know, setting up some office space for um, therapists that, you know, a few cubicles with a, a common waiting space or something like that, that would be a really good use of this space. I think people would really want that. So that just, you know, my marketing tip of the day, but I'm glad to see that there's more space in the front because that was going to be one of my suggestions um, because just to make it more of a commercial, you know, to keep the vitality in the area, um, there's just a lot of small businesses and small seems to be working even this kind of tough time. Um, and then I, I'd like to talk about parking, but I don't know if you want to do that later or Doug, what do you think? Like, how do you- I think we ought to talk about it some now. I mean, you know, um, let's, you... let's give John our comments and presuming, assuming we actually continue to the next meeting, you'll okay. have a chance to respond to him if he hears him tonight. So, so, you know, basically this is like half the amount of, you know, looking at the whole, Whole project as a whole, which I know is not how it, you know, was born, um, and you know, so we have half as many or less than half as many parking spaces as our um, bylaw set out as the standard, um, and so I, you know, have raised these concerns for um, the buildings in the area. The residential buildings in the area have much more parking per unit. I'm not sure about the bedroom count, and so. I went back and um, found notes um, on something that I, you know, some, you know, I know John was going out on Tuesday mornings. I was going out on Sunday mornings around the same time. And at Spruce Ridge 22 High Street, it had 12 units and 28 cars on a Sunday morning in the parking lot. Um, there were 13 cars across the street in a building that had six apartments. I think it was either 513 or 531 Main Street. Um, the parking lots of those buildings on the south side of Main Street were really full. And so to me, it I think one, having one space per unit, knowing that there's some two and three bedroom units in these buildings is just too little. And so, um, you know, and so my, my concern is, you know, there's not, it's, and the focus in the bylaw is on the needs of the tenants and the peak parking uses not on average use um, and not on, you know, you know, the need to put as many units or as big a building on the site as possible. And so I'm trying to, str I'm struggling with that dilemma where, you know, on one hand, I think this building is too big for the site. We're kind of cramming in, you know, there's a little bit of open space here. You know, some of the places that you know, Michael has pointed out like the lawn in the back is really just too little. Like I went out there today 
um, unfortunately, people behind the new building um, can't really get access to it and aren't using it because they don't have doors to it. And so I, I was very encouraged to see the idea of putting, you know, using some publics, you know, putting together a patio or some seating to create some kind of cohesion or some kind of sense of community. But, you know, there's not enough spaces and the, and the building, the size of the building is creating all sorts of pressures on the site. And so I was thinking about conditions that would handle these problems. Um, and I could go into those if, if people want to hear it or if people have responses. Um, one of the conditions would just be to reduce the size of the building and increase the number of parking spaces. Um, and I think it would be more, um, the, the building would fit more with the look of the street and fit more with the smaller building and the other buildings around it. Um, I would, I really am almost vehemently against um, restricting the amount of parking that tenants can have because it seems kind of a, a contradiction to say to tenants, you don't need parking um, because I'm not letting you have it. And so, you know, obviously if tenants who have two cars will have to, can't go here. And so, you know, that's not really what the bylaw is saying you know, um, to restrict it. So I wondered if you wanted to stay with this amount of parking spaces or a few more, if in the manage in the in the conditions is, you know, not restrict the tenants saying you can only have one space per unit, lifting that restriction. And if tenants actually have more cars, a commitment to find spaces for them elsewhere. It could be at the Red Barn parking lot at night. Uh, I don't know what the plans are for the VFW. There's a lot of nighttime parking across the street and it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to arrange. Um, I'm trying to think, let me just read my notes for a second. Um, you know, and also maybe a commitment to some kind of van service, um, which we see um, at one of the, I can't remember if it's, Asp if it's Aspen or the new one on, um, on Route 9, the, the, stu the student housing thing, they have a regular van they run or vouchers to make sure people can get places. But I think we have to recognize that people have cars. There's going to be more than one car per unit. And the fact that the, there isn't that much, that many cars is because the tenants aren't allowed to. And either they, the people there either have no car or one car per, per unit. So I'm just looking for some way to make sure that these tenants and future tenants have a place to park, just like I do, and we all do here. So Janet, I'm hearing two issues. One is you're uncomfortable with the mass of the building. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's something we would do as a condition. You know, we'd have to just get it, you know, work with John to have it smaller by the time we approved it. Yes. Um, so, and then in terms of future parking, accommodations. Um, Chris, what kind of leeway do we have to, you know, guide the future of parking provision on a project? I mean, I would assume it's pretty limited. It is limited. And if you were to, um, if you were to suggest that John make an agreement with um, a local property owner, that local property owner would need to get a permit to allow um, parking from elsewhere to park on his property. So it, it's not um, un, impossible, but it's a little complicated. It would involve a permit for the other um, landowner. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I will say that, that I, I actually share some of the concerns that Janet has with the mass of the building. Um, I do appreciate how you've reduced the size of the frontage on, on Main Street, but it hasn't really done very much in terms of the mass that's behind the house to the north of it and is looming over it. Um, I, I, my recollection is when you did uh, the first building on site, you know, last year or the year before, whenever that was, you had a rendering of how the project looked from farther to the west on Main Street, looking down the hill, kind of from uh, the Dickinson homestead. And I would be interested in seeing that um, because I think this is still an awfully big project. Um, and I, I, particularly in light of the fact that this is right next door to the uh, future home of Amherst Media, which 
is in a historic district and went through an extremely onerous approval process to come up with a very uh, consensus, uh, uh, you know, sensitive architectural design. I think this project here is, is, is frankly, it's relatively undistinguished. Um, you know, it's, it's not a particularly sensitive insertion onto this area, uh, which is right next to a historic district. Um, so I, I have, I'm sort of, I'm a little bit conflicted about it. I, I support more housing in town. Uh, so I don't have any, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to that, but I, but I am worried about this project and that um, it's, it's likely to be poorly received, um, it just, you know, despite your best efforts. Um, so in terms of the, the parking, uh, I'm actually not as worried about the number of spaces as I am the fact about the fact that more than half of them are compact cars. Um, I, I just don't think that that's a realistic mix for, for people today. Um, and that you'll end up with a lot of tenants parking in your commercial spaces out front. Uh, and then the commercial people won't know where to go to park. So I am, I'm hopeful that if we continue this this evening that we can uh, see the evolution of the design in the next meeting. Um, so I have four hands that are up. And um, I think Nate, uh, yours is the last, but you're a staff member. So maybe you want to comment on something recently said. Oh, no, sure. Thanks. I was, you know, going to just ask the board to, you know, their thoughts on the four parking spaces out in front, as we can see on the view from the south, you know, I do find that the parking spaces encroach onto the street, um, you know, and just the overall kind of site plan and layout. So, you know, there has been some comments about, you know, the open green space or is it usable? Um, same thing with the, um, you know, the HVAC units will create some noise and if they're stackable, they'll be pretty high. And so, you know, if there's 30, um, you know, if each unit has their own outdoor unit, that's quite a few units in the, in, in between those two buildings. And so, you know, staff had considered it, could they be uh, located, uh, you know, on a roof area, you know, and be hidden from view or are, are there other ways to, to situate those? So, um, you know, it will be visible from Main Street and from Gray Street. So it's really not, um, you know, even with some, some screening with vegetation, I think that, you know, it, it could be that it is quite noisy in that area if they're all running. Um, if that's, you know, if that's energy, you know, heat and cooling for the unit. So um, those are just some additional comments. All right, thanks, Nate. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I do wish that those parking spaces near Main Street were not there. Um, of course, I think that would probably result in reducing further the number of spaces, which is already pretty uh, marginal. Um, so, Maria, I see your hand. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm just kind of trying to write my notes down. Um, let's see. So back when we were talking about, uh, way back when we were talking about the circulation, um, I I I had thought from the drawing, it all the um, the dry valves looked about the same. So now I'm hearing it is still two way, and it's 18 feet at Main Street, and then it goes down to 16 at Gray. So I misunderstood. I thought it was all one way, and um. At this point, I would say probably for that issue, just make sure you have really good signage about what is an exit and what is two way. Because I I misunderstood. I assumed it was one way, just from this drawing. Um, and and that to that point, it is kind of hard to know what is being proposed because there are so many versions and in between. So I guess for next time we'll have the final definitive like landscape and architecturals. But um, and, and yeah, like to what Nate was just saying, I didn't understand that those would be stacked. I think I heard it, but I didn't realize that they would all be stacked on those red rectangles. So I guess I just, you know, a little more clarity on what's being proposed would be great to, to be able to give um, useful feedback. It's, it's just hard because um, I've been trying to listen as well as take notes and, and look at the tiny screen. Um, I don't think, I mean, I, I agree with you, Doug, that the building does still feel, feel large, but the L shape of the massing 
in the back actually fits with the project that John built, I forget, two, one or two years ago. That scale feels right to me. And then what they've done to the Main Street scale, I think, fits with the existing and the building they built last year. So this, the scale of the massing, I think, actually is pretty good. I think what the problematic issue is still is just yeah, the proximity there it is the kind of creating this sort of valley like um, public space in a way between the existing and the new. So that that's that's really tricky because they chose to keep that house um, is just where it's landing. But I I feel like the scale of it having the higher stuff in the back towards the other building, which is also three stories, I I, I have a less of a problem with it architecturally and from the public realm side than I did last time. And um, I'm not sure that it should really mimic the historic, I mean, I appreciate the colors, but I think having it mimic what they built last, the, the you know, the first piece that's um, more linear, that helps tie those two together better than having like, you know, these two, these two the existing and the new, they're, they're not gonna match that closely because one's historic and got a lot more detail and the new one I think making it look more like the other new project that was already built makes more sense um so yeah I mean without you know these projects are by right what we're supposed to be doing is proposing a lot of conditions so you know we can't I don't know maybe Chris can correct me but I mean we can't can we I don't, we can't say redesign it all we've got to like keep honing in and giving you know, um, constructive criticism to get this um, project more to what we think the town would be amenable to. Um, and I agree, we so desperately need housing. And so I guess the, the, the conflict is in amount of parking for the amount of need that the project is asking for. And so I'd like to hear, I think John had a lot of research maybe on some parking. I would just like to hear how that is being handled as far as the need of the site parking um, versus what they could fit on site with parking. And, and I also want to just reiterate that it is really close to downtown and bus lines. So to say, you know, to point to the zoning and say, this is what's in black and white, you always have to look at the project's context and look at where it's located and look at the type of user and um, the type of uses in the building and, and take that all into consideration to just blanket you know, say it has to have this number of parking spaces every single time is unreasonable. And that's why their zoning boards and planning boards is to review these projects, you know, parcel by parcel, parcel by parcel and um, use by use to really, you know, not make it un unreasonable or un un um, So um, anyways, yeah, I'd like to hear more about- um, we, just, we just lost your audio, Maria, something- you then, So now you're back. Okay. Um, so anyways, I just would like to hear more about how the parking is being um, handled as far as uh, the, the proposal, the newest, the latest proposal. Yes. All right. Thanks, Maria. Um, John, I see your hand. So you, John, your yep. hand. I got it. All right. Yeah, well, to address a couple of the... Um, the comments that the massing of it, I can understand somewhat where you're coming from, but um, you got to keep in mind the future of the corner of Gray Street where Amherst Media is coming is probably about eight or 10 feet higher grade wise than where this building is. So you're going to have a 27 foot tall roof peak at Amherst Media coming down from the center of town looking. Uh, you probably won't see a, a lot of this area. It's just going to blend in. And to that point, on the corner of Dickinson and Main Street, there is already a three story gray building there that has a one story um, addition to it next to a two story building and a two story building to the south side of it. And further up Gray Street, there's a, a building that had a third story added to it, actually, probably about 10 years ago again with a two-story on one side and a two-story on the other side. And you talk about trying to make things blend into the neighborhood here. And yes, you know, I looked at the option of tearing it down, tearing down the old building there. But as I told you before, my thought process is 
to have this blend in with the neighborhood. And I think coming into the cultural district, having a building like this and the, and the existing building there just kind of makes sense to me to have it blend into the neighborhood. And the fact that we're not disturbing any of the screening along Main Street or Gray Street, you know, it is what it is. So we made the front of the building look more presentable. I think it blends in fine. Uh, we gave up units, we're giving up square footage, we're giving up bedrooms. I think the parking issue, nobody's really talked about 462, the building that we did last year. I know I've mentioned that there's 16 cars for 32, for 35 bedrooms there. That's less than 50%. And there's very little foot traffic up and down Main Street other than to catch the bus or to, to walk uptown. Um, I just think some of the issues you're looking at kind of from a dark cloud perspective, worst case scenario, you have to look at, here it is. This is the way, the way it's been for a year now. It's kind of a proven thing. And there's other developments, newer developments, uh, some of which I use the data on. And the newest one, um, I checked with the rental agent at South University Drive, which are all one bedroom and studios there. Um, their units are already rented, fully rented, and she said for 40 bedrooms or 40 units there, she has 26 cars. There's actually 45 units, but they haven't held a lottery yet for the uh, five affordable units. So she took those five units off of the total of 45. So that's a 65% bedroom to cars ratio, which is pretty much what I've been saying all along here. I think my data says 0.67. So I think a lot of things that play into the why there's fewer cars now, especially now with gas going up, um, who knows what that's gonna be, but this is kind of a non-transient development where we're trying to get people to use the bus, get people to bike, you know, get people to walk where they need to go and plan ahead and carpool and that type of thing. It just, you need the housing more toward the downtown than on the outskirts. And I. I just really put a lot of thought in, into creating this. All right. All right. And as Thanks. far as the AC noise, um, that's really an issue of old. These new heat pumps, and I was trying to find you know, the uh, decibel level. You go behind the back of the building that we done last year, and those heat pumps are larger. You have to look at which one is running to figure out which one's making noise. And it's not a noise, it's just a, a gradual hum. You really got to look at them to see if the fan is turning. So I don't think, you know, the noise part is really uh, an issue. Um, the compact spaces, uh, that data that I did those couple of mornings I went out, um, I got a sore neck turning my head trying to figure out which kind of car it was and marking it down and it was going by. But of the 239 cars that I documented in those spaces during those two times, 72% of those 239 cars are 15 feet, six inches or less in total width, the total length, and an average of uh, 71.79 inches wide. So they fit fully in, into a compact space. And even the largest car that actually happens to be at 462 is a Mercury Grand Marquis, which is uh, 17 feet something long and 78 inches wide. So it's only like uh, three inches wider each way compared to the average. So it's a whole different ball game of the vehicles that are out there nowadays. I mean, facts are facts. You looked at any stoplight you come through, you drive through any parking lot, you don't see big cars. You're seeing small cars, you're seeing smaller SUVs that are very popular now. It's just, it is what it is. So I would appreciate you're not kind of looking at this through a dark eyeglass and see worst case scenario type thing. I mean, facts are facts. So these are what people are driving now. And a lot of younger people aren't driving because they don't want a car. They don't want a house. You know, they want their own space and that's it. In fact, those South University Drive, um, they've got a mix of some undergrads there, about 25%. The rest are grad students, visiting scholars that are here for a year and they don't have a car. 
and professionals. So this is the demand that is out there for housing, you know, especially near downtown. So I just ask that you kind of give it a little leeway in, in this overall big picture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Jack, I'm gonna call on you next. Janet, I see your hand. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, again, this is my last meeting on the on the planning board. It's a little bit of my swan song, but uh, I have to I have to say that I don't think there's anybody on the planning board that is a parking expert. Uh, it may seem that way, but I I don't I I, mean, I am quite confident that's the case. I thought John presented a very strong argument about how, uh, given a particular living arrangement, uh, people know that in advance and uh, they either choose to live there or not. Um, if you're living on a farm and you have 10 spaces, you may have two cars uh, and a truck, you know, <laughs> and a motorcycle or whatever. It, 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 it is really, you know what you are as a tenant, you know what you are getting into. And John had presented some, you know, examples where there's 100% occupancy with with the parking situation that that he's presenting here, and I know the former Drake there on Amity has zero parking, fully occupied. So I'm just a little tired of of the parking, uh, you know, being that parking drum. Um, and I know we have, you know, we we have new bylaws that speak to that. Um, I'm not sure if they're in effect yet, but <laughs> uh, maybe Chris can can help me with that. But um, but I thought John really tied it up there in his discussion. Okay, so it sounds like you are satisfied with the amount of parking. You're you're willing to approve it as as proposed. Yeah, especially with the bus line there, and you know, it's right. just it's yeah. I mean, we, we kind of went through this all before, but all right, thank you, John. Yeah, the other all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. The other thing um, that really hasn't been mentioned is there's actually about 20 to 25 parking spaces available along Gray Street. And I think this is brought up during the Amherst Media video that I happened to watch part of one time. Um, so there are other parking areas fairly close by that in, in the event that I don't see foresee happening, but there are other options for people to park. Um, we've had delivery trucks, you know, Amazon and FedEx and UPS coming through 462 for the past year. And I mean, nobody's had any issues. Uh, and again, a lot of the students that we're seeing coming in, uh, in fact, the Board of Health had a presentation by some UMass students done on May 5th uh, when we had a hearing with them. And their presentation was kind of about COVID and the mix of the uh, the character or the makeup of people in town now. And they said that there's more international students coming in to Amherst um, than there ever has been. Um, international students usually don't have a car either. And they're, they're used to walking, they know what they gotta do and they, and they get on a bus and do whatever they do. Um, it just, especially in this location, I just think uh, this makes a very nice site that complements the town and, Complements a need, or you know, results in partially filling a need, and it's just a good spot for it. And if, again, I really put a lot of thought, and I don't look at just little things. I try to figure out. That's why I looked at the Amherst Media to make sure I wasn't duplicating colors and stuff like that. And so I try to think it out. Anyways, I guess that's my point. Thank you, John. Janet. So, I, John, I totally appreciate how much effort and time you put it in there into this project and collecting data. You know, I think in a way we're birds of a feather in terms of I'm surprised we haven't run into each other early in the morning counting cars and stuff like that. Um, so I do appreciate the changes to this. I appreciate the effort to it. Um, just on the parking front, it's, you know, I think we're, you know, the board has to follow the bylaw. and I spent a lot of time looking at the new bylaw language and it gives flexibility, but it also talks about the ensuring adequate parking for the proposed use. And this building will be around for decades. And so we have to make sure 
it will happen, you know, it will, you know, the people who live in this building will have facilities that will work for them for decades. And so when I look around, you know, it says, look at 800 square feet, 800 feet away, which I'm not sure what that is. But when I have looked around the street and the um, apartment buildings, be they large or small, they're full of cars on weekends. And so that's part of the peak utilization. Salem Place is almost always full. The 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 six you know plexes and four plexes across the street are full on the weekends. Um, you know, even that fitness together thing that the, the board permitted, there's a couple of um, apartments there. That parking lot has a lot of cars at night. During the day, the cars are away. So that's good for the people using the commercial spaces. So, you know, the data I think supports that people are driving. I mean, I think COVID actually has boosted the amount of um, students driving. I don't think that's gonna last forever, but I think we have to do is follow the bylaw and do what it tells us to do. And so I do think there's not enough parking, but the bylaw also says, gives you an out. There's, it gives you six different outs. And I think one of the outs is gonna be a real easy fix, which is the lease parking. Yeah, you need a permit, but it's site plan review permit in the BN. And so I think, you know, just getting that permit, talking to somebody else, I'm sure, you know, somebody at the Red Barn or whoever owns that complex would be happy to get a little extra income. That, that parking lot is almost empty at night. You know, it could be an arrangement of if needed. So, you know, if you don't need it and your tenants aren't restricted and, you know, not allowed to have cars or only have one car and they don't need it, then, then you're in the sweet spot right? Like the miracle has finally come. Americans have gotten out of their cars. It just hasn't happened yet from what I'm seeing on the street for housing that's for undergrads, you know, regular folk, grad students. There's just a lot of people, cars parked in lots in the different apartment buildings. So, I, you know, I've said that about that, but I, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to make it work for you and also to make it work for people who live there a decade from now you know, there's two and three bedroom places. There could be families. We know family life goes up and down in terms of needs for cars. So that's, that's my thing I wanted to say. Um, getting back to um, future pictures, I wonder if we could see the buildings without the trees in front uh, or the leaves. The trees can stay, but without leaves, because I think that's part of the view from the different streets. And I know that six months of the year, we have no leaves, deciduous leaves on trees. I always hope that April will be um, more leafy than it is. And so I would appreciate, because I think that will give a sense of what it looks like from Gray Street, from Main Street and the massing, which I think is kind of intense. So I just, um, I think that's it. Thank you, Janet. Appreciate, appreciate it, what you're working on though. John, by the way, it's uh, it's after eight and we usually take a, a break at eight, so I'm, I'm thinking we are probably going to want to basically halt, put an end to this conversation this evening and continue this hearing to uh, June 29th. So I'm um, hoping in the next, let's say, 20 minutes, we can wrap this up for this evening. Jan uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, just, Jan, I want to address, you know, one parking area that we both agree is usually full is Salem Place. Um, you got to realize a little history there. Salem Place was built as condominiums to be sold as individual units, which they were. Um, and then when the people tried to resell them, um, they couldn't resell them because of the market or whatever. So now all of those owners said, well, I'm just going to rent it to the undergrads. So they jack up the rent. And that's why there's so many cars there. Um, I don't tend to do that, and I don't foresee anybody owning this in the near future besides us. And um, so it's just a different scenario, I guess. Uh, and as far as you know, the options on a new parking bylaw, I think, are under Section Seven Point Zero Zero Zero, the permit granting authority shall determine the adequate number of Austri parking spaces based on the criteria. And another section says that we have to design it for adequate uh, the language, the adequate and appropriate for the proposed use. Now, the basic use here is residential. And that's kind of why I went out at you know, 4 a.m. figuring, okay, residents, you're sleeping at 4 a.m. 
if you have a car, it's outside. But all of those criteria under 7.00 fit this site. You know, so, you know, peak parking needs, proximity to downtown public transit, other modes of transportation, all that. It just fits this site to a T, I think. And just ask for some consideration on all that. All right, thanks, John. All right, I don't see any other hands. I guess I will make one last comment, which uh, uh, I think Re is it Rachel had mentioned that she remembered that I had asked or suggested to paint the historic house to match the, uh, the new building. And I, I, I'll, I'll just say, I don't remember making that statement. And uh, if I did, so be it. Uh, I don't feel strongly about it. That was um, Chris. What's that? That was Chris that I think suggested that. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. Then, then my memory Very is good failing me. Um, so um, maybe, the, maybe the red trim could stay from my perspective. Chris, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about um, the issue of who is going to be able to vote on this. And um, we do have three members who are absent tonight, Johanna and uh, Andrew and Tom. And if they watch the video of tonight's meeting, um, they can be eligible to vote. So I just wanted to make that statement in public because if people see them come back next time, they may wonder you know, why they would be eligible. So if they watch the video and they submit a written statement that they've watched the video and read the material, um, then they will be eligible to vote. Thank you. Certainly, Chris. And I think I heard Jack say that this was his last meeting. So it's likely that on the 29th, we'll only have six members. Uh, Maria. Uh, I just wanted to quickly put it on the record that I am supporting this project with the number of parking spaces shown because uh, of, of the presentations tonight and of previous uh, projects that have come before us based on where this is located and the type of user for the project. Um, I, yeah, I think I agree with Jack and, and with what was presented by John that uh, I think that this project um, will work for its site and we can't predict the future. None of us on the planning board are parking experts. Um, so I feel like a lot of things have been said, but that, that I'm just giving my own opinion, but I, I, we just want to be clear that things that are said aren't necessarily facts all the time. So um, all I'm giving is my opinion, which is that I support this project with this space is shown, but I would like more information for the next go round just to see what is being proposed exactly, because it was hard tonight. But, um, but again, I appreciate the effort um, from all of the team. Okay, thank you. So I'm not seeing any more hands. Uh, I think at this point I'll uh, ask if there are any public comments on this project. All right, I don't see any hands raised from, from the attendees. So in that case, I'm gonna make a motion to continue this hearing to June 29th. Um, Chris, should I make it at 6.25 p.m. or some other time? You are muted. My, my. Okay, so please make it to 6.45 because we have the Amherst Dog Park coming back at 6.35, and I would like confirmation from Pam that I'm saying the right thing. You are saying the right thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, correct. so my, my motion is that we continue this hearing to June 29th at uh, 6.45 p.m. Would anyone like to second that? Maria? Second. All right. Any further comments from the board? Oops. No. So uh, in that case, we'll do a roll call. Maria? Approve. And uh, Jack? Approve. Uh, and uh, Janet? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that the motion passes four to nothing.
uh, with three members absent. The time is 8.18. Actually, before we, before we break, uh, John and Tom and Rachel and Mike, thank you for your, uh, your work and your presentation this evening. Uh, we'll see you in two thank weeks. You. And I'll all right, say thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right. We're all Jack. Thanks. Have, time have a productive night. Good night. Okay, so now the time is 818 and we'll take a five minute break. Uh, members, please mute yourself, turn off your video, and we'll see you back at 823.
All right, the time is 8.25. <clears throat> We've had seven minutes since we broke. All right, so we were, it looks like all the board members who are present are back. And, oh no, Jack, Jack. Mm. There's Jack. All right. All right. You're you're muted, Jack, but I but we love you anyway. I'm just saying I, I never eat dinner, so that's why I don't want you to see you guys, you know, me eating. So um okay. I'm on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh Chris, can we go ahead with uh the next item on the agenda? I see that Nate's not back. Do we need Nate? Um Nate, oh, yeah. here. there's here. Nate, Nate, and we back. need um, Claire Bertrand and Ron Laverdier to be moved over into mm -hmm. um, the uh, panelists, please. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go ahead and read the intro. Uh, so the time is 826, and we're going on to item four on our agenda, which is a public hearing, which has been continued from June 1st. Um, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice hereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested persons to be heard. Uh, Ron, you are not muted. Would you mind muting? I'm trying to do that here. All right, well, we can do that for you. Uh, I thought we could do it. He's all set. Okay. Um, so is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding site plan review 2022-10 for Amherst Office Park LLC at 463 West Street. This is uh, continued from June 1st. We're requesting, you're requesting a site plan review approval to rebuild a retaining wall, deck and walkways on the south side of the building, resulting in an increased lot coverage. The project also includes new plantings and new pole mounted site lighting at the front of the property. Map 19D, parcel three in the BVC zoning district. And the second hearing is for a special permit 2022-04 at the same property address uh, with the same map parcel and zoning. This is a request for special permit to extinguish previous special permits, ZBA FY84-00085 and ZBA FY85-00094 as zoning has changed and mixed use building is now, is currently permitted by site plan review. So first, do we have any board member disclosures? I do not see any hands raised for disclosure. All right, uh, Ron and um, Claire, would you like to go ahead and make your presentation? 
Welcome. Good to be here. Um, let's see. We had a failing retaining wall at the 463 building on the south side. Um, we decided that it needed to be replaced. And at that time, I thought since we were going to have uh, heavy construction uh, backhoes and, and excavators there, it'd be nice to build a deck at the time for the benefit of the tenants in the building. And so we added the deck on, and then I thought it would be nice to have a sidewalk that connected the deck to the existing sidewalks. And uh, we began that process. Um, we were requested to do a site plan for this, for this site because we were gonna be adding some coverage, uh, approximately 695 square feet. So we, this building sits on actually a parcel with three other buildings. And so we ended up uh, working with Eaton and Associates to calculate the exact square footage that uh, would be under coverage at the, to include all the other buildings, all the parking and the new 695 square feet. And so we're here now, we've had plans uh, sent to the town and uh, we're looking for an approval on that. All right. Uh, are there drawings that you want to have us put on, on the screen for you to show us what is happening? Um, well, the site plan, the site plan drawing would be uh, a good start. Uh, Pam, do you have any drawings available for this? May I say that uh, I think Nate can share his screen. He's the most familiar with this project and he could probably unless Pam's got something ready to go. I have the packet, but I thought Nate had other things that he was gonna share. Is that is that true, Nate? Um, well, I was gonna start with the survey that was in the packet. So, you know, like Ron said, the, you know, this used to be different properties and over the years it was combined. And so it's, you know, it's actually a few acres, there's many buildings. And so as part of this review, I'll share my screen in a minute. The planning board is also oh, okay. approving this new surveyed site plan, right? So um, the previous one was from 1989 and it was modified in the early 90s for some permits in the mid 90s, but really there hadn't been a survey to show existing conditions since then. So, you know, what was included in the packet and what, you know, what's visible on the screen, you know, this is the entire site, right? So the building we're looking at, if my cursor is visible, is right down here in the, in the corner and then, you know, the, um, but this entire site is what, um, you know, the planning board re would be approving. So as part of the approval, this becomes the existing conditions plan. So we, you know, the building commissioner and staff met with Ron and went over that just to clarify because the lot coverage was very close to the maximum. And so we just wanted to confirm that everything, you know, the number of parking spaces, everything was um, being approved. So, you know, included in the survey was this, you know, um, you know, the parking is fine. The law coverage is, uh, you know, 69.37 or percent, you know, it's below the 70% maximum, but it's been, you know, verified by survey. So, you know, we're satisfied that the dimensional, those dimensional standards and the parking um, are satisfied. <clears throat> and so, you know, what Ron mentioned was this part of the building, um, or, you know, the back deck, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. The, uh, you know, there's an existing retaining wall here and an, an existing deck um, and that's getting removed. So the new, the new wall is coming further out. It's a terraced wall here. So, um, you know, there's one retaining wall in this section that's almost eight feet in height or seven, seven feet, um, a little over seven feet. And then it, you know, this retaining wall, there's is, you know, there's two retaining walls here, a terrace, so a flower bed with plantings around it. The wood deck is being replaced. There's a sloped walkway to meet the deck. Um, and then, you know, what's changed recently is that this existing ramp down to the back of the building uh, was found to be too steep. Uh, even though it's existing, if you're fixing it, you have to bring it up to code. So what's currently there is, I think, over 20%, Ron's mentioned. It might even be, a, you know, 25% uh, slope, which is too, too steep. And so... Um, so what's being proposed instead is, I was gonna, you know, there's here are the site plans. I'll zoom in 
uh, is actually a set of stairs uh, going down this ramp. So instead of a ramp or a sloped walkway, it's a, it's a set of stairs. So, you know, 15 stairs um, with, you know, equal tread and, and height, and there'll be railings on either side. So, you know, from when this was proposed originally, um, really the, the only change has been this addition of um, stairs. And is it, is, it, is it correct that the lower level, the, the basement where these stairs lead are not and will not be a publicly accessible space, so they are not required to have an accessible path to them? Correct. So you can see in the image here, you know, there's an entry here that will be served by the stairs and then, you know, where the retaining wall will be, will be in here and it becomes, you know, a, an outdoor little space. But that is only used by the tenants of the building and not by the public or for delivery. So uh, it can it can be you know exceed uh, you know the ramp could be steeper or it can have steps, but it doesn't need to be accessible. Okay. All right. Um, board members, are there any questions about this? Janet. I knew somebody would have questions. I have like macro questions and, and small questions. Um, so these other um, permits that you're asking to extinguish, are these these special permits just for this building or the whole complex that you've built or acquired or whatever? So when this was permitted, those original permits are only for this building. So it was um, in the limited business zone and to get a, have a mixed use building required a special permit. So the first permit was to construct this building. And then a year later, there was another permit to modify it to um, just change a few things about uh, the spaces in the building. So those two permits are only for this building on the site. Okay, so that, so that is not all, what you just showed us. And then I don't think I've ever seen those original permits in my packet, but I've gotten so much paper lately and duplicate paper, I might have missed it. So, no, so, yeah. so if we haven't gotten it, my question is, you know, we, you know, I've seen some draft findings. I see a, a draft um, permit. Is this the same thing, or you know, as the previous stuff? Like, I, it's hard for me to extinguish a permit I haven't seen without knowing what was in it. It's like, or did you just move everything over into this new one? Do you, if you see my question. Sure, no, I think that, you know, the previous permits, I, I think it may have been in the development application report, you know, they had uh, just only a few conditions, you know, um, you know, six conditions between the two, um, you know, that said that, you know, the, um, you know, there's only four apartments in the, on the upper floors, the commercial tenants needed to stay on the ground floor uh, that, um, the businesses needed to be um, approved by the commercial, you know, um, commercial tenants before, you know, had to go before um, the planning board or, or permit granting authority, um, you know, it's kind of standard hours of operation. And this was also before the zoning bylaw said that, um, you know, now the, the use category allows for, um, you know, tenants to live there and for then for visitors, you know, commercial visitors to come to the site. So before it said something that uh, visitors needed to be by appointment only or something at first. And so the bylaw covers that. Um, the building commissioner and I also thought that the permit requirement of having any change in business go to be pre-approved by uh, the permit granting authority is also excessive. So, you know, a tenant can change if there needs to be a site plan because of that in terms of outside changes, that's fine. But the way, um, you know, commercial space changes, we don't require necessarily every time that that be pre-approved by through a site plan review or a special permit, which is what they had originally done back in the 80s. They actually wanted it to be another special permit every time a commercial tenant changed. Okay, that, that, that's a great answer to my question. Um, my, my smaller question is um, about the deck. And um, is this deck just for use for the commercial tenants or can the residential tenants also use this deck? And if so, could you make it bigger? And that's not, not for you, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's basically just a little spot. I wanted a little spot out there so people could go out and have lunch. Um, you know, the, the first floor is is APHIS, which is a federal agency. And, you know, they, you know, they just, they don't really have an outdoor space. So, you know, without 
actually leaving the front area of the building and and walking across the parking lot and out to uh, where we have a little uh, patio area between 447, 445, and 451. So I, it, when I was doing this, I said, boy, it'd be really nice to have a place with a couple of tables and uh, and and uh, a spot for people to just sit and have a have their lunch outside. It's also, we're, we're seeing an extremely competitive market and it's the amenities that that make the commercial space um, more desirable, and you know that's one of the reasons uh, we even added the deck from just being uh, we we increased the size of the deck already. Um, the second thing is there are some windows down below, and we've got this set up so that it 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 goes above the door but stops at the second set of windows. And that could be seen on the existing walkout area looking east. Um, so the idea was not to, not to darken those windows when we chose this deck location and size. Aren't those windows uh, just a storage unoccupied space? Well, you know, the government will often be, you know, they'll, they'll move things down there, they'll be down in the space, gathering, moving. Um, it's not a, it's, it's not just storage. I mean, uh, you know, the guys will go down and they, you know, might um, be working on traps down there or whatever it is that they're they're prepping for the agency. So, you know, I, I just think that, I, that the sunshine coming in is quite nice and darkening it would be, you know, I don't think would be as nice for, you know, for the folks when they're down in that space. All right, thank you. So the tenants could use that deck at night and then do the tenants ever use that gravelly area? Like, you know, I noticed in your other buildings, there's like balconies that people can sit on. And I was just kind of hunting around your site for spaces for the tenants to use. Um, well, obviously the tenants on the second floor can go right down on the set of stairs between B and C. And there's a set of stairs there that, that enter and then the door exits right outside. So, you know, the tenants do and can go down and use that space if they choose. Okay. I and mean, that's, you know, it's up to them, um, but I, but I, the reason the deck was, you know, shortened to that size was, you know, the, the, the natural light going into the basement. Okay. Great. It's, you know, it's still 12 by 14, so it's still a pretty good size deck, you know, certainly enough room for a couple tables and perhaps even an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> if we could keep it, if people can remember to shut it <laughs> before nighttime and, mm -hmm. you know, wild thunderstorms, otherwise the umbrella ends up somewhere else. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, Maria, you haven't spoken, and Jack, I don't even, where's, uh, neither of you have spoken. Do you do you have any uh, comments, pro or con, or you're you're good with this just the way it is, and we should go ahead and go to a vote. All right, uh, Janet. I, okay, Maria. I see your hand. All right. So, do we need to review conditions first and all that stuff, and then yeah. go? Yeah. I, I'm fine to do that. I don't have any questions. Okay, we will. I will ask for public comment too. I just wanted to get through everything with the board. Chris, um, I just wanted to note that Nate provided a development application report, and he may have had suggestions in there for you to think about certain things. And also that there was a site visit, and I think Janet and um, can't remember who else came. May Doug, Doug came. Yeah. Yes, um, I so think Tom. May, Tom arrived too. Tom, so you may want to report on the site visit. Thank you. Okay, that's a good was, point, Chris. Was, uh, Janet, you want to do the site site visit, or do you want me to try to remember what what we saw? I would love you to start because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm today. I was like, well, you know, because and I was hoping Tom would because he had a very he had a bunch of very specific issues. Uh -huh. so. All right. Well, um, my memory is a bit dim, but um, we, Janet and Tom and I did meet out there 
must have been a little over two weeks ago since it was right before our last meeting. And um, we saw the existing conditions similar to what was shown in the photo on that slide that we saw a moment ago. Um, we, we did hear from Mr. Lavertier that long term, he was thinking it might be nice to have a sidewalk from the uh, existing public sidewalk that went uh, west uh, between his property and the, uh, I guess it's Slobody property to the south and uh, might, might link up eventually with some housing if it, that were to be built uh, to the west of his property. Um, we did talk about the, the deck and we talked about the, the existing ramp. Uh, we looked at the lighting fixtures um, and in particular, he had a sample of the, uh, the luminaire uh, for the, the site light that he's proposing. Um, so we saw that it looked like it was consistent with some of the other lighting that he's got on the, on the site. Um, and I think there was some, there was some concern about the level of light uh, in the area of this uh, new work. Um, but he did point out that there was a, a fair amount of light from a floodlight that was coming from the adjacent property. And he has plenty of lights uh, on his Start at the west end of his uh, building and around toward the north side. Uh, so that's my recollection off the top of my head. Janet, if you have anything to add, I'd be um, happy to have you fill in the blanks. Sure. Um, there also were, there's two other, there's the lights that um, Mr. Lavertier wanted to replace was one that was on the um, east front corner on 116. And I think it needed new wiring. Um, and then I think he wanted to run um, an underground, um, um, why am I blanking, wire to um, set up a new light where there's supposed to be a bus stop built when they do that big roundabout project. I noticed that around that area, the ground was sort of uneven, at least like towards the back. And then um, also, I, I don't know if we can see that on the plan. Right. So the um, here's the, you know, here's the, the structure, the building. And so here's one proposed light pole and then another one. All right. So these are the two out front. Here's 116 at West Street. Yeah. And then, um, you know, when we were looking at the ramp, it is quite steep and um, just in, you know, the retaining wall is in terrible shape being eaten by termites. Tom Long was interested in having a light pole put on the west side down near that ramp area or now stairway area because um, he was concerned about you know whether people who are parking at night or leaving at night or you know residents would be um, have have you know adequate lighting and it seemed you know I think we talked about that for a while on the building in that corner is some like very harsh safety light and then there's an apparently even stronger one on the um, building next to it and so it seems kind of overlit and not really meeting our lighting guidelines. And so I could see the good sense of putting in a more temperate pole, but I don't, I didn't quite see the need myself at the moment. I'm trying to think of anything else. And then, you know, there was talk about landscaping and um, putting a, a fence, not, I mean, not, not a fence, um, something along the stair, the retaining wall. So people wouldn't just like drop off. Uh, the uh, on this plan, there is there is a railing that runs along the sidewalk that that connects to the deck. Okay, that's it. So okay. so that railing has been added and then loops around and then follows the stairs down. Um, the lighting next door, unfortunately, uh, you know that we have to live with that and and federal protective services actually requested the light on the west side of the building that lights the parking area mm -hmm. um, you know it's all 9 11 related um, after 9 11 federal Prote protective services got very concerned with government agencies and and they they actually um, uh, required the installment of that light above the parking area. And I agree 100% if I could, if in the future, 
um, the the tenancy on that first floor changes and the federal protective services doesn't have um, control over the lighting above that i would love nothing more than to have another post light um, just to the east of the of the walkway and stairwell or no just to the west excuse me of the walkway and stairwell and i think it would be a, a good as good a time as any to run the wire and and the underground uh, conduit for that light. It just wouldn't do anything right now, but certainly in the future, if uh, if APHIS were to move and other tenants occupied that first floor, we could remove the, at least we could remove one of them that are under my control and then put, put up a post light that has much softer and, uh, you know, I think just a much better feeling. Um, so that's, you know, that's the best I can do on that. All right, thank you. So, um, Chris, you mentioned that uh, Nate did pro develop or provide this development application report. And um, Nate, do you want to take us through that, or do you want me to see or ask the questions you've suggested? Well, you could ask. Like, I mean, I looked at it quickly. You know, I I just you know my questions were. Um, there were many, um, you know, basically would the, would the landscaping be maintained? Um, is the lighting um, downlit um, and is it adequate? So I, I, you know, other than the maintenance of the landscaping, it seems like most of the uh, issues to consider have been addressed. I don't, Doug, you may have, may see some others. No, I, I, I did not see this as a particularly controversial project and it seemed pretty complete in terms of its the proposal. Uh, Janet, your hand is still up. Is that legacy? No, I wanted to do one add to the um, the conditions or on the lighting. Um, so, um, I, you know, I, I agree that the lack of controversy um, is is definitely here. I mean, it looks like you know just improving the whole situation, and you know, the more you looked at it, the more you saw to fix, and that's what we're looking at, and it's very cohesive. I would request that the, the light at the bus stop go off a half hour after the last bus. Um, the one, the, the light pole near the um, building makes sense to keep on at night for tenants coming in. But I think just, you know, you know, we basically after business hours and it'd be great not to light up the sky or interfere with natural life when we don't need to. So I figured a half hour after the bus, the last bus leaves, I don't know if that's 11, it'd be great to turn the light off and, um, you know, someone might get picked up or walk out, but it wouldn't be needed anymore. So that was my one condition. Suggested. Uh, Ron, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know what the, what the last bus stop is. My, uh, uh, an awful lot of people from uh, the, the multitude of buildings we have at the Amherst Office Park area will often walk over uh, to the Monin Dove and, and then vibe or go get, you know, go get a coffee late at night if they're studying. And anything that improves the lighting that walks, that, that, that follows along the sidewalk, I think is a good thing to have. And I just think they, the best thing we could do given the fact that the uh, the ready mart there is open 24 seven and that the, you know, oftentimes people won't leave the moan and dove until one or one fifteen. I, I don't see any reason to be turning a light off at a, at that spot when it would only be improving the safety on the sidewalk. I forgot about the moan and dove. Okay. <laughs> so that's, you know, if, if the last bus was at 11 o'clock, I just think it would be, I think it's just given the fact that even somebody who might be cramming for exams or, you know, yeah. whatever, leaves my, the, the buildings north of, the, of this site and would walk across the, 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 um, the public um, walkway and go get a coffee at two or three in the morning at Ready Mart. I, I just think it makes a ton of sense to have it just go on with a photo cell and go off with the photo cell. Can you remind me, is there a sidewalk on that side or will there be one? There is a sidewalk on that side. Okay. That's where the sidewalk is and where the bus stop is proposed. Okay. 
So, you know, I just think the photo cell system works great. I mean, they don't use a lot of power. I mean, these LEDs are, it's like running a 45 watt bulb. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, Nate, do we have, do, or do we need findings and conditions this evening? And I'm, I'm not sure I'm seeing them in my packet. They were emailed on, um, I think a few occasions. I have them, I can pull them up. All right. Well, I think it, it sounds like we would be ready to vote on this this evening. And so if we can plow through those, that would be great. All right. And then I don't know, Doug, if there's any public comments. Well, uh, we can ask at this point, sure. Anybody want to make any public comments from the attendees, from the public? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, Ms. Bertrand. Yes, hi. I just wanted to um, share with the board, my name is Claire Bertrand. Um, I have been both a resident quite a few years ago, um, and I work here. I work with Ron Lavertier, and um, I have seen this building um, for many years and seen it interface both with residential tenants and commercial. Um, and while um, your site visit might have shown you us not at our best um, with the plan to replace that wall, uh, the landscaping hasn't been given any attention, but if you did look around the property, um, we have seven office buildings here. As Amherst Office Park, the park-like setting is our, our goal. Um, so having well-maintained, beautiful, um, healthy bushes, flowers, clean beds, um, everything is well cared for. So that has been the tradition for 30 plus years and it would no doubt continue because you wanna to continue to have a building that welcomes commercial tenants and residential tenants alike. So I just wanted to share that, that the, um, the building um, will be enhanced and go back to the good condition it has always been in. Thank you. And, and you say, when you say that you work here, here is your part of the property management or development group that Ron is in, or not that you are a- That's correct. Not that you're part of the federal agency in the building. That's correct, Doug, thank you. Yes, I actually am, I contract as a property manager for Ron Laverdier in the Amherst office park. I will say though, however, um, a little over 20 years, I did actually, 20 years ago, I did live in that building um, new, when I was newly married. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good example of mixed use and how it can work. Um, yes, so that's my relationship. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, uh, Nate, do you wanna go through findings and conditions? Sure, if this is visible, uh, these are the draft findings. Yep. All right, so um, we're ready to move forward 11.2400. The project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw. The applicant has applied for site plan review, approval for mixed use building in the BVC, uh, Business Village Center Zoning District. So it's a, you know, it's a allowed use. I'll just keep reading until I hear comments. Is that, Doug, is that fair? Is that yeah, and, and, and should, should we clarify that these are findings and conditions for this site plan review and that we are not talking about the relinquishment of the special permits yet? All right. 11.2401, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. The current and proposed use of the property is unlikely to create these detrimental or offensive actions. 11.2402, abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Exterior lighting will be downcast and or shielded and will not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Landscaping will be used to buffer adjacent properties. 
11.2403, provision of adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities has been addressed. The project provides an outdoor deck, flower beds and green space for passive recreation. The applicant is proposing new site lighting to accommodate the planned bus stop. 11.2410, unique or important natural, historic or scenic features will be protected. Uh, the site does not have such features. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuse disposal as described in the management plan. So there was a complete management plan provided and you know nothing's changing there. 11.2412, the project will be uh, or is connected to town water and sewer. 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within, the, within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. The minimal changes to the site do not impact stormwater. So there, you know, that's a, a, a waiver request. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes new plantings on site adjacent to the building deck and retaining wall and existing mature trees will be retained. 11.2415, the soil erosion control methods are con considered adequate to control soil erosion, both during and after construction, as there is limited erosion from this project. 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. The proposed uses do not generate nuisances. So there really isn't a change in use there. 11.2417, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit requires that exterior lighting be downcast and are shielded and not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2418 is not applicable. The property is not located in the FPC district. 11.2419, uh, uh, Nate, again, I guess not... I have a format question. Sure. There was an earlier one that was not applicable and you didn't have a NA at the beginning of it. Uh, which one is that the? It was farther up, maybe. Uh, 2410. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Doug. Is, is that a fun And what about 2413? Is that? Sorry, I just lost my formatting. <laughs> 2413, the proposed, yeah. the stormwater, is that? Not applicable, or or there are some changes, but they're, uh, you know, minor. There are no proposed changes, so. Um, well, I guess that's your call. Right. Well, you know, in terms of like the flood flow conservancy, it's really just not in it, so it's not applicable at all. So you know, there could be potentially mm -hmm. um, stormwater changes. It's just not. They're not being proposed. Um, okay. All right. Well, all right. you know, I mean. I mean, yeah. I can look at 2416. I mean, I know. I feel like there's a number. So it's like, I'm, maybe this is unimportant, but it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think they're good questions. Days. I mean, you know, I don't necessarily want to make it my call that there are no nuisances, right? So if the board finds that, then that's great. I don't want to assume that there aren't any. Uh -huh. um, you know, so 11.2419 is not applicable because there are no wetlands on the property. Okay. 11.2420. Um, I'm saying that the board did not uh, refer this to the, you know, the design review um, board. Um, so it's not found to have a significant impact on the surroundings. 11.2421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping and entrances and exits with surrounding buildings and development. The applicant has demonstrated that the project meets setback requirements and parking will be served by the new walkway. 11.2422, here's a not applicable. Um, building sites shall avoid to the extent feasible the impact on steep slopes, floodplain, scenic views, grade changes in wetlands. And so there are no steep slopes or floodplains on the site. 11.2423, uh, not applicable. There are no changes to the buildings on the site. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate. HVAC equipment is screened and vegetation will be used around the deck. And so, um, you know, for here, you know, we're approving the new site plan for the you know, entire site. And so there are a number of HVAC units uh, and those, you know, 
a condition of previous permits were that they be screened and they appear to be screened. And so um, uh, that's there. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site in relation to adjoining ways and properties. There's adequate drive aisles and sidewalks to keep pedestrians safe when using the site. 11.2431, uh, not applicable. There are no changes to the proposed location and number of curb cuts. 11.2432, location and design of parking, bicycle racks, drive aisles, and sidewalks provides a safe and convenient, convenient use of the site with parking spaces adjacent to walkways uh, and crosswalks are provided where necessary. 11.2433, there is access to adjoining properties as previously permitted for the Amherst Office Park. Uh, so on the north side of the site, um, you know, uh, there's a pedestrian connections to 417 West Street. 11.2434, not applicable. Um, there are no changes proposed for driveway locations. 11.2435, uh, there is joint access driveways between adjoining properties as part of Amherst Office Park. So, you know, in the entirety of Amherst Office Park. 11.2436, not applicable as there is no change uh, in use to impact the traffic generated at the site. 11.2437, again, not applicable. Uh, no traffic impact report will be required. All right. And then you had some waivers, a list of the waivers, I guess. Right, so the applicant proposed to waive, you know, the requirement of a sign plan. There's an existing sign that remains, so you're not proposing to provide any a traffic impact statement. Uh, waiver request lighting, you know, they're proposing two new light poles to match existing. Uh, and then, you know, a soil erosion plan wasn't provided because of the minimal nature of the project. Same with construction logistics and pollution and hazardous material. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, board members, I haven't seen any hands, so I'm assuming that these findings were acceptable. I'll just put these on one page. So these draft conditions, some of these, um, you know, they apply to the, they'll apply to the whole site and they also, Janet, your request or question earlier, that um, they also uh, carry over some of the conditions from the previous permits that, um, so we can walk through these. Uh, so draft conditions, there's 11, uh, the project, including landscaping, shall be built substantially in accordance with the plans submitted to the planning board and approved on uh, June 15th, right? June 15th. Uh, the walkway from the parking lot to the deck shall meet accessibility requirements. Um, you know, that's pretty standard. All lighting shall be dark sky compliant. Uh, this one is, I was typing, Jen, as you're writing, the pole light adjacent to the bus stop will turn off within an hour after last uh, bus service. And I'm not sure if that's something the board wants to consider. Yeah, I, I, I mean, my sense was that Janet pretty much accepted Ron's explanation for why he didn't think it needed to happen. Yeah. All right. And so this was a, you know, a previous um, condition. One of the residential units shall be reserved for the on-site manager. So within that building, one of those units is reserved for the on-site manager. Uh, and Ron, has that been, uh, oh, has that worked out all right in practice or has that been a burden? You are, you are muted. Um, that condition was put in when my dad built the building and he was the on-site manager. He subsequently has, has left and completely forgot about the condition and uh, rented his third, it was the third floor, one bedroom apartment. He rented that uh, and it's been rented for probably the last 10 years. Um, so, you know, that, that we were hoping to extinguish that um, since it was part of, a, uh, of the condition of allowing the fourth apartment on the third floor of the building. And that was, that, so that was some, one of the ones we wanted to extinguish. Uh, any board members object to eliminating this condition? I do not object. So Nate, why don't we go ahead and remove that? All right, uh, so that, that's easy. Uh, there should be no office or commercial use on the second floor. Again, that's something that was from the previous permits and the building was constructed. So, uh, 
I guess, why would we, I mean, I, I assume the building now has residential units on the second floor. Um, is there any particular public interest in having, in, in prohibiting commercial use on the second floor? Nate or Chris? No, I mean, we actually, you know, the way the mixed use bylaw is written now, it's, you know, it can be on any floor, so. Yeah. yeah. Now, now to, to be mixed use, I assume there needs, needs to remain some residential in the building, but it sounds like there's now residential on both the second and the third floor. So do we need this? I think not, but you know, I mean, that's it, it. It's highly unlikely in my lifetime that it would switch back to commercial given the, you know, given the, um, the fact that we're all we've all learned to uh, work remotely. Well, and I right. assume if if it changed use from residential to commercial, you'd you'd have to make some level of public accessible route to the yeah, second and you'd have to the to put second an floor in the building. And and yeah. you probably and would I, find you know. that you know prohibitively expensive and complicated. Yes, exactly. Um, but I don't know why we need the why why we would need this condition. I guess is sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, some of it was like I said. This was from the previous permits, and it, I think it's just a you know for, for discussion. So if that's if it's, yeah, we can remove that. Um, so now the so I removed that condition. Uh, the so now the fourth condition is the survey dated May twenty uh, May of twenty twenty two shall become the approved site plan for the property. So that's what was you know was um, shown earlier during this discussion. So how is this related to the uh, extinguishment of the special permits? And are we combining the two? The two? No, so this is, you know, so the, so the original, so this is still for the site plan review. So this okay. is just saying that the new survey becomes the new site plan. Okay. You know, All right. Just, just to clarify, so that if someone's going through the records, they they don't find the 1989 uh, survey on rec, you know, on record and say, "Wow, here's the site plan." Okay. Um, all HVAC and utilities shall be screened with plantings. Um, the plantings along the perimeter of the retaining wall should be maintained as a safety measure. So you know there were U's and plantings around the retaining wall. Um, all landscaping shown on the plans and survey shall be continuously maintained. So that speaks to what Claire had mentioned. Uh, and eight, the lower level entry and associated, uh, say stairs, shall be for commercial tenant use only and not for the public. <laughs> so, don't we want to say that that level is part, has to be part of a lease with a commercial tenant who's on the first or other floor? I don't think it needs to be in terms of meeting code. It just needs to be a commercial tenant. Okay. Janet. Um, do we have a site plan that shows stairs, not the ramp that we're approving? Because I'm not finding, I'm, I'm looking through my packet for the new yeah, staircase. That was a late change and it didn't make it into the packet. Okay. But I thought I saw on the screen this evening a site plan that did show stairs. I would, I would reference that plan and the date so people looking back can figure out what we were approving because there's other pictures mm -hmm. plan. Okay, yeah, so that was the add in a uh, revised revision date of um, June 13th. So maybe uh, on the first condition, the project shall be built substantially in accordance with the plans dated June 13th, submitted mm -hmm. to the planning board and approved on June 15th. Perfect.
All right. Um, So, so I guess I'm a little bit stuck on the last one because uh, it's my understanding that the Massachusetts Access Board regulations apply to commercial space, workspace. And so if, if that's, if, if, you, if this was, if the lower level was leased as a standalone commercial space, it would have to have an accessible entrance. And it's only because it's sort of non-public ancillary to some of the upstairs space that it doesn't have to have an accessible entrance. Is that, am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, so I guess, I, yeah. I think maybe when you first said I didn't quite, when you just explained it, it made sense, yes. So, so I, I don't know exactly how to, to put it, except that it, it the lower level needs to be non-public support space for the, the the commercial operations upstairs. Chris, what do you think? I don't have an opinion, but I think Rob Mora is here as an attendee, so he may be useful to. Oh, is he the Rob? All right, Rob. We th I think we allowed you to talk. <laughs> I still muted. We can. Uh, hi, Doug. Yes, um, I with uh, agreement with what you said that the space, if changed to a standalone commercial tenant, then uh, with access uh, available to the public, it would need to be put. You know, an accessible would have to be created in that area. Would it would it be possible to have a commercial tenant use that is not public? Yes. Oh, really? So, so it could be rented as a standalone commercial space that's not public. As as long as it's used by employees only. That's right. But in that instance, wouldn't it be required to be accessible? Not for the employees. Only if there were public uh, okay to visit the, the right. space. Okay, um, so in fact, that means that the text that's here is, is fine. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for walking me through that. Janet, do you have a comment? No, okay. All right, Nate, so we've been through the conditions. Um, I don't see any hands, I'll offer Additional public comment to any attendees if you want to make some now. Not, not seeing any. Okay, uh, would anyone like to move these findings and conditions for this site plan review? You're gonna make me do it. Jack, I'll let you go this time. I'll say uh, so moved. All right, this may be your last motion. <laughs> Second. Thank you, Janet. All right, uh, any further discussion? Chris. Are you planning to approve this? And why don't you roll it all into one where you say, close the public hearing, approve the application and approve the findings and conditions and waivers as discussed. That sounds very efficient. And then there's yeah. also the hearing for this waiver of the special permits. Is that a, will be a, sep a separate vote? Yeah, why don't we do that as a separate vote? So Jack, can we amend your motion to accept the findings and conditions, approve the, the site plan review, and close the public hearing? Is that right, Chris? I got all three? That's right, yep. Very good. Do you accept that amendment, Jack? Yes. Okay. And uh, Janet, you accept it as a second? I second it. All right. Okay, we'll have our, our vote. Um, we'll start with you, Maria. Approve. And Jack. Approve. Uh, Janet. 
Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Passes four with three, abs three absences. Thank you. So the time is 9.18. And we'll move on to the second part of this hearing uh, to extinguish this, the special permits. Um, and this is because the parcel has changed uh, zoning and a mixed use building is now allowed with site plan review, which we've just approved. So um, is there any discussion about this? Uh, Nate, is there anything you want to say about this? No, I think that you know the, the uh, findings and conditions you just made apply, right? So you know with those new conditions and everything, I feel like they, they would satisfy those special permits from the 80s. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, I guess I'll ask if there's any public comment for this particular issue. And I do not see any. Okay. Um, hey, Maria, do you wanna make a motion to extinguish the site plan? For the special permits for this property? So moved. <laughs> so, sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, I'll Chris. Say. And to close the public hearing. And to close the public hearing. And these are the two special permits uh, ZBA FY84, number 85, and ZBA FY85, number 94. So the motion is to extinguish those two permits and to close the public hearing. All right, then we'll go ahead and vote the, this through. I'll um, second it. All right, thank you. Thanks for jumping in, Janet. Uh, Maria? Approve. And Jack? Approve. And Janet? Approve. And I'm gonna approve as well. Okay, 921, uh, Mr. Laverdier, I thank you for coming and thanks for your presentation. Good luck with your project. You are muted, but I know you're, you're, you have a smile on your face. Yeah. Now you're not well, muted. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Okay. All right, the time is 921, we'll move on. Uh, item five, the first item in old business is the subdivision 1989-9 with the Meadows, definitive subdivision plan. Uh, and we were expecting Mr. Flower from Tofino Associates. I don't see him in the attendees. Chris, do you wanna introduce this? Yep, um, Mr. Flower was the original developer of this property that, that um, and, and the uh, original subdivision um, approval was given in his name. And then um, Tofino or Cole Construction took over the uh, <clears throat> property. And um, we have several people in the audience tonight who might wanna speak about this item. Um, one is Felicity Hardy, who's the attorney for the homeowners one is Doug Donnell, who is the um, president of the Homeowners Association. And another one is Connie Kruger, who is a resident there. Um, and Ted Parker is also representing Tofino and he's in the audience as well. Um, but I can just give a little bit of an introduction, which is that um, this is another one of those subdivisions that took a really long time to, to build. Um, not quite as long as um, Amherst Hills. And I think all of the properties in the Meadow subdivision have been uh, developed. I could be wrong about that and somebody could correct me, but these, the problem that they're facing is the same. The problem is that the roadways have um, deteriorated over the years and the roadways, I don't believe have their uh, final top coat on. And um, so the residents are coming to you to see if there's anything that the planning board can do to um, make sure that the roadways do get completed and that um, eventually the town 
will take the roadways. And as you know, in Amherst Hills, um, the roadways have been completed and the um, developer and the town is currently talking about the town taking over those roadways. So um, that probably isn't gonna happen for a while, but the project has moved in a positive direction. So seeing that, I think the people who are in the Emmer in the Meadows subdivision, we're hoping that a, a similar process could be um, could help them. So you may want to let them speak for themselves. Yep. yep. And can you say maybe it's a repeat? How many of the lots have been sold? I think all of them, but I'm not sure. That could okay. Be so by... we can ask the the speakers. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, should we move any of them over into the panelists? I think so. Yeah. Um, Felicity oh. Hardy is the uh, attorney for the okay. group. Um, Doug Donnell is the president of the Meadows Homeowners Association. And Connie Kruger is a former planning board member, former select board member, and she is a resident there. So, uh, and Ted Parker um, is also in the audience, and he may or may not want to speak, but um, I, you might want to ask him if he wants to be moved over as well. Okay. Um, well, let's see, Pam, while you're moving the others over, Mr. Parker, would you like to be moved into the panelists? And so you can speak more? Oh, you've been moved. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, I don't know which of you to start with. So I'll just maybe I'll start with Doug since he raised his hand. Um. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I should probably ask you to give us your name and your address, since most, yeah. most of the time that's what we do with public comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Douglas Donnell, and I live at 46 Hopbrook Road. Uh, I'm the current president of the Meadows Homeowners Association. Um, just a, a couple of points to clarify. I have a little statement that I'd like to read. Uh, I don't do a lot of public speaking, so I thought it would be uh, better to, to read from a prepared statement. Uh, but we do have a top coat. This development has been finished. To my understanding, the last home was completed in 2004, and the roads and all of the construction has been completed for 18 years, something like that. Um, I was not living here at the time, so I, I'm not 100% sure on the exact dates, but something in that time range. So it's a little bit different than the Amherst Hill situation. Um, so that said, I'd like to just kind of go uh, present to you what I've written um, as a way to uh, clarify what we're asking the board tonight. Um, I've asked to be on your agenda tonight to one, present our situation and two, request any assistance that you can offer within your jurisdiction and three, place in the public record a request that Tofino and the town work together to finalize a punch list and a timeline for completion of that punch list so that our roads can be presented to the town council for taking. Uh, I've indicated, uh, excuse me, I've included a brief chronology of the last 20 years in our letter to the board I did this to help give you a better sense of the history of our process of trying to have Kestrel and Hopbrook taken as a public way by the town. This has been the plan since our development was accepted by the town. We all purchased homes in this neighborhood with the clear understanding that our roads would become public streets. Uh, we have repeatedly contacted both the town and Tofino in order to expedite this process. As I said in my letter, it's been a long it has long been our intent to work collaboratively with Tofino Associates to accomplish the shared goal of completing the work on Hopbrook Road and Kestrel Lane. However, the lack of clear communication combined with the lack of follow through has eroded trust in Tofino's willingness to finish this process. We would like your support and any assistance you can offer to facilitate this process. Currently, we have no basic we have no recourse to basic maintenance of our roads. Indeed, several catch basins are collapsing and the US Postal Service has submitted a hazard re report referencing one of these catch basins. Several potholes have developed. We find ourselves in kind of a no man's land. 
Tofino ignores our requests to fix the catch basins. The town can't because the town does not own the roads and we can't have them repaired because we don't own them. The town did provide warning cones for the collapsing catch basins, which we appreciate, but this is not a long-term solution. As the road ages, these issues will continue to increase in frequency and severity. It is our hope that these repairs, a punch list and a clear plausible timeline for the completion will be presented to us in the coming weeks. If this is not the case, we will return to the board and request that you require Tofino to put up a surety with clear conditions and dates for the completion. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present before the board and thank you all for your service. Thank you, Douglas. Um, Felicity or Connie, do you want to say anything at this time? Mr. Chairman, yes, thanks very much. Um, and thank you for uh, taking on this extremely old business. Um, uh, I, I think uh, I want to reiterate uh, what uh, some some remarks of Doug's and um, suggest a concrete step that we think uh, the planning board can um, can undertake that would really help. Um, we're we're really interested. We're not interested in having an argument about like what's happened over the last 20 years, but we are really interested in getting these uh, roads accepted as public ways. And in order to do that, we understand that uh, Tofino needs to um, make some improvements to the roads that were uh, identified by the town of Amherst. About a year ago, um, there was an agreement um, and a meeting between members of the Homeowners Association and uh, Mr. Parker representing Tofino and the town, and there was an agreement about the need for, to develop a punch list of uh, tasks that need to be, needed to be done for the roads to be in a, a condition that the uh, town would accept them as public ways. But unfortunately, nothing has happened with that punch list. So our request tonight is that the board direct the town and Tofino to come up with that punch list and then bring it back to the board in 30 days or you know, whatever reasonable time would be required. I don't think that there's any real dispute that some things need to be done. But what we need is an actual concrete plan for the punch list and the continuing involvement of the board um, so that everybody understands what needs to be done. And then we can determine how much it's going to cost and whether or not the bond that Tofino has previously posted for the completion of the work is adequate. We don't even know if the bond that's the, that the town is holding for this work is adequate to do the work because we've never been able to even get the punch list. So uh, again, our request tonight is that the board direct the town and Tofino to you know, meet or collaborate or do whatever it is they need so that we have a punch list. The punch list is brought back. Hopefully we'd get a copy of it. And, and then um, at, the, at a sort of a meeting a month from now, the planning board could determine what the next step would be. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Hardy. Ms. Kruger. You are muted. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to add a little perspective and a few other details. Our situation is not as uh, extreme as Amherst tells, but still a lot of work was never completed out of the original subdivision. And it's a real concern for the homeowners. I'll just give you a little example. One of the street trees in front of our house was split in a storm maybe two years ago, called the tree warden, said, can't help you. That's not a public way. You're on your own. So we you know, paid the freight to have the tree removed because it was really unsightly. That's just a small thing. But not having our roads accepted as a public way is a real um, detriment to uh, living here, quality of life, and the assets that we have invested in our homes. I, 
uh, myself and my partner, Susan Tracy, have lived here. We're the first occupied dwelling on Hot Brook. Um, all the lots have been sold and built on, as um, Mr. Donnell had, has uh, told you. My understanding from a prior meeting with the town planner a couple of years ago was there's about $23,000 held in escrow. There was a vote, I forget the dates, I don't have it in front of me. It was sent to you um, prior to your last meeting showing that the planning board had voted to ask for, um, it was $20,000 for each unsold lot. And then that would be released as each lot was sold. That never happened. So I feel like the town has not really, uh, I know that all of you are not those members. This was a long time ago. Um, but uh, we're really looking for the town to step up a little and get the punch list, get the dollar amount. And if what the 23,000 isn't adequate, which I very much doubt it is to do something, we would just like to trust Defino, but our trust has eroded as Doug said, because we've waited years. We'll have a meeting and another year will go by. Now we're worried we're gonna miss this construction season. There'll be even more deterioration. Um, just, uh, as I was thinking about this on your agenda, I think we really should have been listed under old, old, old business. So um, with that, I'll, I'll conclude and um, hoping we can hear a little more from Tofino about what their intentions are at this point. Okay, thank you, Connie. Uh, Chris, can I ask you a couple of questions? Um, I see that the original, the 2001 planning board approval uh, this is from Mr. Don Donnell's notes, um, was for $130,000 to be held, but only $20,000 was uh, uh, received. And then I assume that has expanded to the $23,000 that Ms. Kruger just mentioned. Um, was the town remiss in not collecting uh, funds each time a, a lot was sold? So I can explain that to some degree. Um, in the past, um, the way these things worked was that um, there were lots that were held in a covenant. And I've never seen the covenant for the uh, Meadows um, subdivision. So I, I'm not sure about this, but typically what happens is that lots are held. And then at um, a certain point when the, um, when 50% of the properties are developed, um, I should back up. As lots are requested to be released from a covenant, um, the staff goes to the town engineer and says, is there enough infrastructure to support the construction of a house on this lot? And if the town engineer says yes, and that would be you know, sewer and water and paving to get to that lot, um, if the town engineer says yes, then the staff would advise the planning board to release that lot to be sold and be developed. So the way Amherst has worked in the past is that they do that up to a certain point, which is about 50% typically. Um, and then after that, they start asking for um, surety to be paid to the town. Um, I was not here when much of this happened back in the past. Um, and so I don't know what was asked for as lots were released. And according to, um, I guess it's Connie Kruger, that never happened. There was never an amount that was paid for each lot to be released. So that, I don't know why that happened, but that's what, um, that's what one would expect to happen. So then there would be a pot of money available at the end to presumably pay for or assure that the roadway could be fixed mm -hmm. um, so that we don't have that money. And there may be uh, Felicity or Connie may be able to explain a little bit more about the history of this, because as I said, I wasn't really involved back then, but that's kind of the way it normally should work. And that m the money for each lot would have come from the developer as he received the payment from the buyer. That's correct. And then that money is put in an escrow account in the right. accounting department in the town. Okay. Yep. And then I guess the other question I am going to ask before I call on the two people who have their hands up, 
the punch list that was created back in 2019 with by Jason Skeels. Do you have any idea what the value of the work was at the time? And if you don't, that's fine, Chris, and we can see if somebody else does. I don't know, and I don't know if there was a value um, put on that punch list, but I can find out. Okay. All right. Um, so, Janet, you're the only one with your hand up at the moment. Thank you. Um, Doug, your questions were my questions. I'm wondering what document or when the planning board approved the 130,000 surety, was it just a vote? Was it a document? Was it part of a permit? Like what's, what was it an order? Like what, so, I, you know, I guess we don't have that paperwork now, but like what was, what did the planning board do and how do we know they did it? Okay. Um, well, and then also, does anyone have a punch list? Okay. Uh, Ms. Kruger. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take, oops, um, I'll take a shot at that. I, I was just rifling through my folder and of course I can't find that one piece. It's minutes from that planning board meeting when that was approved. And I think the planner working on it was Niels LaCour who's no longer with us. We had gotten that in a meeting a few years ago from Ms. Breststrip. So it's in the records. I, I have it and uh, Doug, you had it because that's the one I brought over that we sent over to Felicity and I just can't get my hands on it, but it's from minutes of the planning board meeting. Um, in terms of the value for the punch list, um, we, we don't have that. And what they were, we met with DPW with Tofino in the fall of last year. And there was uh, a negotiation going on about what was gonna stay on the punch list or not. So we're really in limbo because we don't know what the town has agreed to accept from Tofino for that punch list. So we're, we're kind of in the dark about the value. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Donnell. Uh, um, yeah, just to clarify. So that, uh, that was approved by the board on February 7th, 2001. And it's from the minutes of February 7th, 2001 for the approval of 120, basically $10,000 per lot, um, which, and it, it doesn't give a lot of detail, but, but it's $10,000 per lot and $130,000 total. And would that, uh, the topic that the board was discussing at that meeting, was it approval of a subdivision plan? You were releasing lots. Uh, you, I shouldn't say you, the board, excuse me, the board was we, we, releasing, are, the board was releasing institutional. Lots. Okay. Yeah. So the, so the, the, I can read it. The board received a request from Tofino Associates Inc. Uh, for the release of lots 8, 20, and 23 at the Meadow subdivision. Mr. LaCour explained that the developer needs to provide surety for the remainder of the work to be completed. Estimates for the amount needed were provided by Tofino Associates and the town engineer. Uh, Ms. Ellen uh, Stutzman, represented Tofino Associates, said that the, their estimate was probably higher than the town engineers because they included some extras. Okay. Um, frankly, what caught our ear, having listened to the uh, meeting several, about a month ago, was this was almost identical language um, that we heard at that meeting. And uh, when Tofino was asking to release lots for uh, Amherst Hills. And it just, it really struck us in that moment, which was why we acted when we did. Unfortunately, you didn't receive a letter uh, from uh, attorney Hardy uh, at that meeting when you released those lots to Amherst Hills. But we were just struck by that. And here we are, you know, 18 years later, still trying to get our roads approved just actually still trying to get a punch list that both the town and Tofino agree on so that we can estimate the cost and then schedule the roads to be fixed so that then they can go to town council and go through that process to be approved. So we recognize that this is not going to be a quick process, but it, it, it hasn't moved at all in 15 years. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to, I'm finally, Mr. Parker, I see your hand and I'm very interested in what you have to say. So 
<clears throat> this situation is regrettable and it is in some ways significantly different than the Amherst Hill situation. And I think that some history, it, it bears, it would be useful to recount some history. Um, the last lot was sold in the early 2000s and Doug Cole, who was the owner of Tofino, along with Gloria McPherson, who was a staff person for Tofino, uh, completed the road. Uh, unlike Amherst Hills, where the road was never completed, this road was in fact uh, completed. And there was a punch list uh, that Jason Skeels gave to Tofino and Tofino addressed all but three items on that punch list. Um, Doug Cole, and, uh, and some of which was some pretty significant repairs to the road. Uh, uh, the crossing of the brook, uh, uh, at the beginning of Cross Brook had to be repaired. The guardrail had to be repaired. There was a bunch of work. I was not involved in that at the time. I worked for Cole Construction, but uh, I was not an employee of Tofino. Um, and uh, I, I only knew it by, by uh, the fact that it was happening out of the same, in, in the same office. Um, I, I, I don't know, I can't speak to why uh, the ball was dropped um, because none of the people who dropped the ball are around anymore. Doug Cole died in 2010 after the financial crisis of 2008. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't learn about this. Uh, when Doug Cole died in 2010, um, I stepped in to try to um, clear up the unfinished business that Doug uh, had going, which was significant, not just in Amherst, but in other towns as well. And I've been doing nothing but trying to uh, finish the projects or do, do what I can to, you know, D Doug was a, a, a much beloved developer and uh, had really good intentions. And um, clearly there was a, a lack of follow through in some areas. So I didn't learn about this problem until I, I want to say 2013, 2014, maybe it came to my attention. I met out there with Jason Skeels. Uh, he showed me the three items that were that were the remaining punch list items. Um, I presented them to the owner, to the to the Doug's heirs. Other priorities. There were other crises. Other priorities happened and that the work never got addressed. Um, I, I know that there is, I, I remember clearly what those three items were. Um, and uh, there were some also some missing items on the as built drawings that Jason uh, wanted, which is another, another task that has to be completed in order for the DPW to feel comfortable in taking the road. So, Time passed. Uh, the road, the completed road, ha is approaching its the end of its you know service life. I mean, uh, the service life of a road is twenty years. I mean, there are roads, there are budding roads. <laughs> I live in Amherst Woods. Old Farm Road has been you know repaid twice during the time that this road has uh, existed, and Old Farm Road has deteriorated twice. Uh, uh, so. I met in the fall with uh, with Connie and Doug and some other homeowners, and um, I agreed that we would that I was knee deep in trying to get Amherst Hills um, roads completed and get the punch lists established. And as you all know, it's been a big problem. So I've been trying to deal with that problem. And I said to them that um, I needed to uh, get one thing done at a time and that I would certainly, I'm very interested, Tofino's very interested in, in finishing uh, the work. Um, 
but the question of whether or not the road, the, the punch list should contain, should, should include the deterioration of the road is another question altogether. I met with the DPW, I discussed it in broad terms with both Jason Skeels and with Guilford Mooring. And we agreed that we would revisit it this year and discuss whether or not the DPW was comfortable accepting the road in a less than pristine brand new condition because otherwise it, we're probably talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, worth of it, it could very well be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work. Um, admittedly, I have not, uh, I, I also commissioned a lawyer to start drawing up the, um, the deeds to transfer the ownership of the open space and the right of way to the town. Um, and I have not followed up in any more concrete way since then. I have discussed it with Jason in broad strokes, but it's, you know, it's very hard to get, at this moment, it's very difficult to get, the turnaround time for any information on DPW is very long. Um, after the last meeting about Amherst Hills, it took me four weeks to get somebody just to mark sidewalk repairs in Amherst Hills, which is one of the punch list items. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's a capacity issue as much as anything else. Um, I intend to, Tofino intends to follow up and to do our part in, in uh, doing what we need to do in order to get the roads accepted by the town. Um, we have said that to the owners. Uh, we said it sincerely. I, I can only apologize for the length of time it's taking, I am sympathetic to their frustration. Um, Tofino doesn't have a staff. Uh, I, I want to just, um, Chris conflated Tofino and, and Cole Construction, separate owners. Um, once they were owned by the same people, but they're no longer owned by the same people. I work for Cole Construction and I manage Tofino's uh, properties and try to and, and I'm trying to one by one I'm trying to tick them off and clear clear up the unfinished business of Tofino. Um, uh, I am committed. I am committed to finishing the work, and I'm committed to finishing the work uh, uh, in collaboration with the homeowners. I had hoped that we would get to a point where we would all come together and make a a, a collective request to take the roads, and I. I think that a, a useful meeting, a useful revisiting of this issue would be for us to reconvene with the planning board and have Guilford and Jason here so that we can talk publicly and they can commit publicly to what they've committed to, to I think to me privately, that they're willing to accept the road in a less than pristine condition. The road will, there are some components of the road which will need to be repaired, um, but, but I, I think that this discussion needs to happen with DPW in the room so that we can all share the same set of understandings and we can all understand what the commitments are. I've had some meetings, the owners have had some meetings, we may have heard slightly different things. I think we should all share the same set of, set of uh, information that's what would make me happy all right um do you, ted do you have the punch list uh that was created that had only three items remaining to be completed so that i we... can i don't have it with me i don't have it now i can dig it up okay there I think three if, items there's a if you would a... if you if you would send that to chris and and identify the three items that you you agree were remaining to be done and were never completed. Uh, I think that would be a good place for us to start. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do understand that the road's been in service for a number of years that, you know, if, if in fact, Tofino had gone ahead and finished the punch list and maybe a year or two later, the 
town had accepted the roads, you know, the road, the town would have been maintaining these roads for a decade or something. Um, so I think that's a, you know, it, it, it sounds like accepting the roads in less than pristine condition might be a reasonable thing for the town to do from my perspective. Uh, I don't know how others feel about it. So, um, Ms. Kruger, you are muted. Out of practice. Um, I just wanted to say the pristine condition is not uh, the agenda of the homeowners per se. It's, that's the negotiation between Tofino and the town. And, and the town has also been very slow and uh, seeming non-responsive at different times. And, you know, I have a lot of loyalty to the town of Amherst and to my uh, former colleagues on the planning, in the planning department. So, um, you know, these things do happen. We'd be happy to have the town take it with less than pristine. Either Tofino owns it or the town owns it. We will never be the owners. And, you know, at this point, we just want to see movement and that it, we can't seem to move that negotiation, that discussion off the dime. And this has been just the last three years trying to really activate it. And I know that Mr. Parker has good intentions and he'd like to take things one at a time, Amherst Hills out of the way and then the meadows, but uh, it's just um, taking so long, we've lost patience. All right, thank you. Chris, um, based on what you've heard tonight, do you think you could connect with Jason and Guilford and at least get their perspective on this? Sure, yes, I can try to do that, yep. And do you think it would be useful to have them in a meeting, uh, in a board meeting here, or maybe you can talk with them about that and yeah. you know, we, can, we can put together the, the agenda as, as you know, we think makes sense. Right, it, it, it'll probably take a while and some talking to figure out what needs to be done and how the planning board can be um, useful in this situation. That, took a long time in the Amherst Hill situation too. The planning board doesn't really have the power to order we have no, to do anything we have no leverage or order at the, the town to do anything, but you can be a, a forum, a place where people can come and talk about this and try to figure out what to do about it. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Um, I see, uh, let's see, Miss, Miss Hardy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just observe that the the status quo the status right now is that the planning board directed Tofino to do something with respect to the surety that it has not done. Okay, and that was in anticipation of work that needs some last minute work. There was whatever was on this punch list that was going to get done. And then, you know, we were going to be in a position where the roads could be accepted. I, I don't think the planning board doesn't have um, any jurisdiction or any role to play. They do. Okay. And um, so it's really the board's role to make sure that the subdivision is completed in a manner that was consistent with what this, what the planning board uh, you know, required whenever it was that it required it some 50, 20 years ago. So, you know, again, my suggestion about this is um, that the, the current status is that we are waiting for a list of things that need to be done in order for the the roads to be in a place or in a condition where we can present them to the town uh, council for acceptance as public ways. And what we're looking for is, you know, a, you know a, a hearing or a meeting within the next 30 days or so where we can establish what that is and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janet, you look like you're the next hand. Thank you. Um, I would recommend that we put this on the planning board, um, the agenda, not not maybe, you know, obviously not in, you know, next week or in two weeks, but maybe sometime in July, just to get um, 
you know, hopefully that meeting will take place or just to gather information. One question I had after reading the packet was that the question of like, where are we as a planning board? And so I don't have the answer to that legally. And so I would, my question is, are there possible planning board actions under the sub state subdivision law, under our bylaw, or on regulations or a permit that we have issued? And so, I mean, that could be, you know, that requires looking at documents and perhaps the town attorney, town council could do that and advise us if there's any hooks or handles to hold on to. But I, I don't, I feel like I'm just right now floating. I don't know where I am legally in terms of the board and the, I don't know what the documentation is. And so that I need to sort of, I need that information. I think we need that information as a board. So I would recommend putting it on the agenda on a date certain um, with enough time for people, you know, given, you know, people are busy and then also get some more information about documents and where we are. And, you know, if, if the planning board has, a role or what we could do. Um, so where are we legally? Thank you. I will note that it's just about 10 o'clock. Maria. Um, I just wanna say really quickly that um, I'm just looking out for the planning board members. Um, and unfortunately a lot of the new ones aren't here, but uh, I have to say the Amherst Hills hearings were the most unpleasant planning board experiences that I have in my history of being on the planning board because it was very contentious. It felt very much like um, a lot of attorneys sort of barking on us. So I just want to warn you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I just want to warn you that those hearings were the most unpleasant experiences of my planning board career. So um, not to say don't do that. I'm just saying if you can arrange in some way where there's a real clear path forward um that was a really you know having i don't know it was like 50 some neighbors take their turn yelling at us that was really unpleasant so um i'm just putting that out there i don't know if jack if you remember that but i i really hope you guys don't go through what we went through thank you chris i just wanted to say two things um we can put this on the agenda for july 20th um that is the meeting that you're going to hold in July. You're only having one meeting in July. Yep. The other thing I wanted to say is this is a little different from Amherst Hills in many ways, but one of the ways it's different is that the planning board actually had some, um, what should I say, some mechanism, some tool to use um, in the past in Amherst Hills. And the tool that was used was to request that the building commissioner not issue building permits for the lots that were um, that had been just recently released but hadn't been built on. And the planning board doesn't have that kind of tool in this case. There may be some tool that I'm not aware of and we can investigate that, but I'm just putting that forward because um, you know, even though we had that tool, it took a long time to get there. It took like a year of meetings with everyone to get to the point of being able to do that. So um, it's not going to be simple, but we'll we'll try. We'll do something, and we'll talk about it again on July 20th. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like we potentially could facilitate something, but we're not really in a position to force something to happen. At least that's my relatively uninformed opinion. All right, um, Ms. Kruger. I just want to say we are not Amherst Hills. We have followed that closely and I sympathize with Ms. Chow's um, concerns. We're trying to be cooperative, but we would like the town to help resolve this, whether there's actual you know, mechanisms or not. I think bringing DPW in to get the punch list established with Mr. Parker would really help. And I really believe that could happen in a much more timely way. So that's our first ask. But we don't want to escalate and we're not planning to take that tact. So uh, Ms. Chow, I think you can uh, be assured, <laughs> at least at this point, that's not our route. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Parker, you're the next hand. I just want to say that uh, we're committed to collaborating with the owners of 
in the meadows to get this done in a much less contentious way. Um, just, just FYI, you know, I, I went in September of 2019 to the folks in Amherst Hills and, and explained to them where we were and what uh, our intentions were. And their response was to come to you and start that process. And it was so, it was so um, full of vitriol that it, it made no sense for me to come to a meeting and speak civilly like I am trying to do tonight with these folks because the folks in Amherst Meadows, in the Meadows, have been much more collaborative and much more respectful and much more um, willing to uh, have a conversation about it. And I appreciate that on everyone's part and I look forward to getting it resolved. Thank you. Jack? Yeah, I, I just want to say the lesson that we learned from Amherst Hills was was a very good presentation by Jason Skeels, uh, the town engineer, with regard to how pavement uh, goes. When it goes, it goes rapidly, and and so there is a time element to this. And I and, and you know encourage the town to to acknowledge, you know, that it needs to get solved, or it's going to get a lot more expensive for everybody. Thank you, Jack. We'll miss both you and Maria on the board. Okay, um, I see Chris walking away. Oh, she's back, good. I so, wanted to make sure that I put this on the agenda for um, July 20th. Okay, so we don't really need a motion this evening to continue anything. Um, and I think we've discussed this enough. We, you know, Chris, if you can follow up with the DPW and we, figure out whether we need to have them in a meeting or if you can do your magic uh, without a, a, the board present, I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Parker, I think you were gonna uh, send the last punch list you had that, that listed or at least identified the three items that were remaining to be completed at one point in time. Uh, if you can send that to Chris, that would be great. I will do that. All right, thanks all. Uh, and thank, thanks, thanks for staying for a relatively late hour uh, at this point. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, board members. We really appreciate your time. And thank you, Ted, for attending. OK, so the time is 10.06. Um, Chris, the next item on our agenda is planning board fees. And I saw that you sent a letter or a proposal to us for how to collect those, at least as a trial, I believe. Yes, um, and um, may I speak about that? Yes, you may. Um, Nate and I have had several conversations about this and I've talked to Pam and I've talked to the building commissioner. And I think in the end, what we're deciding is that something different from what was in the memo um, and something more akin to what Doug proposed um, at the last meeting where we discussed this. Doug had made a motion to charge um, $500 for each applicant to pay for the legal ad. And at that time I thought, oh, $500 is, um, is really high. So after talking about it with um, Nate and the building commissioner and Pam, I think we've landed on $300 as a flat fee. And the reason that we're doing this instead of what we had proposed in the memo is that what was proposed in the memo actually takes a fair amount of staff time to organize and um, you know, keep on track with. And it also will require us to kind of follow up with applicants if they don't pay the legal ad, then you know, we have to kind of keep bugging them or not give them their decision or not hold a public hearing or some action that we have to take. So it's gonna be a constant aggravation. So we think that the um, potentially uh, more fair and, but also easier method to deal with this would be to charge um, $300. And that's gonna be four times what we are currently charging. Um, as I said in the memo, the average legal ad cost is around 400 to 
it's really actually more between 500 and 600 is what we're finding out now. And so 300 seems like a reasonable cost to have the applicant pay roughly half and have the town pay roughly half and not to have to have staff um, trying to keep track of all of this and chase applicants who may not be paying it. So I think what we'd like is a vote of for the um, planning board to support our proposal to charge $300 for the legal ads and see how that works going forward. And if you need a memo about that, I'd be happy to write one, but um, maybe you can just uh, make a motion and vote for that, vote to support that move. Okay, thank you. Um, board, um, any comments? I mean, I can go right into a motion to that we, you know, we support the, the staff's recommendation to, you know, I don't know, it's not like we approve it, right? Or we, we're just on board with you, right? We're not really doing a, a legal vote for this. Well, you have to, you have to vote for um, application fees. So okay. if we decide to, you know, increase the application fee for site plan reviews and different things like that, you have to vote for that. So I would say, yes, this, this is a good, thing to okay. do as, a, so, as an actual so, vote so. that you are voting to increase the fee for legal ads for planning board applications to $300. So we, we are setting the fee. That's that's mm -hmm. the verb I think makes sense. That's um, right. yep. So, um, okay, so I'll take a, take a pass at the motion. I'm not seeing anyone. Oh, Janet, do you want to say something? So, so it sounds like this is kind of a compromise between the town heavily subsidizing applications to subsidizing less. So we're going to lose less money, but not burden staff. applicants with the full cost or the staff. Is that so? It's sort of like a middle ground that you've reached for. That's a good way to describe it. Yes. Okay. But we, the town will still be paying part of. Okay, it's like half the ad. Okay. But this steps us up closer to covering costs. And and might you know it might be easier to get to five hundred from three hundred rather than from fifty or wherever we are now. To, uh, Jack. Yeah, I guess uh, I would move that we accept the proposal as, as stated by Chris for increasing the fees. All right, thank you, Jack. Uh, I'll go ahead and second that. Uh, board members, any more votes or any more uh, discussion at this late hour? And I only see one attendee. Uh, Ms. Maura Keen, do you want to make any public comment? Uh, raise your hand if you do. And I do not see her hand raised. So, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and vote on that. Legal fees being set at $300. Uh, Maria. Approve. And Jack. Approve. And Janet. Approve. And I'm gonna approve as well. All right, Chris. Thank you. All right, all right, the time is 10, 11. Uh, Chris, do you have any old business topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance? No, no old business. No. Any new business not anticipated? Um, new business just is to announce that we will not have a July 6th meeting and we will go to July 20th, um, but we will have a June 29th meeting. Right. We just continued something to that date. All right. Uh, Form A, a and R subdivision applications, any of those? No. No? no. And ZBA no, applications? No, nothing new. We did at maybe two meetings ago, there were a couple of ZBA applications we were interested in seeing. Um, there we... were, and they, they were supposed to come up on June 9th, which was just... Um, Couple of Today days. is today. Today is the 15th. So it would have been last Thursday. And I did send a memo to Maureen Pollack to ask her if um, those hearings were continued, if the planning board could hear 
a presentation and I didn't hear back from Maureen. So I will get back in touch with Maureen and ask her if those hearings were continued. Okay. Upcoming SPP, SPR and SUB applications. No, nothing, nope. All right. Uh, committee and liaison reports. And we'll start with Jack, PBPC. Yeah, so an email was forwarded to you uh, and that was from the annual meeting and uh, which was sparsely attended, strangely enough. Uh, but I think that's the artifact of ongoing Zoom meetings for this particular group. Um, but I, you know, have expressed my interest to continuing as an alternate commission because I can't be a, a full commissioner because I'm not going to be on the planning board, but I will, um, if I'm an alternate commission, I'll be able to serve on the executive committee moving forward, but someone from the planning board will have to be, um, the regular commissioner. Right. So it's kind of a, uh, an odd situation, but that person appointed by the planning board, uh, won't have to do a lot of heavy lifting, um, as I'll be more active as a, as the alternate commissioner. So just some clarification there, you know, assuming that I get appointed, uh, as alternate uh, commissioner. And who appoints you as an alternate? Uh, I think town council. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so Chris, will we be selecting new representation to committees probably toward the end of the summer? Um, it depends on what you want to do. You'll have your new members as of July 20th. So you could conceivably have an election and reorganization on July 20th if you want to. Right. So um, maybe Doug, you can think about that and decide whether you want to do it then or whether you want to go into August. And August, right. you have a few, you have at least, you have three meetings scheduled in August. I don't think you'll hold all of them, but. Yeah, and I would, I would add that like half the executive committee seem to be alternate commissioners, um, including the director of planning in, in Belchertown, and then you know some other uh, former planning board members, I guess. But so it's 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 you know not an unusual sort of thing. Um, okay. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Uh, so Andrew's away, so we won't hear about CPAC. Tom's away, we won't hear about DRB. Janet, any uh, motion on the solar bylaw? Yes, the committee is meeting for the first time next week. All right, and, and those, but, those, those are publicly noticed meetings and uh, I assume the public can attend. I, I believe, I think, well, I think Ste Stephanie Ciccarello is in charge and I'm sure Chris is nodding yes. And I do believe they're all gonna be public and posted and hopefully right. get a good group involved. Okay. Jack uh, is in the group too. What's that? Jack is in the group too. Oh yeah, okay. All right, and then uh, CRC, anything you wanna say, Chris? Um, yes, the CRC will be discussing um, article 14 and its potential for being extended uh, as a permanent measure um, for certain types of uses. So we're gonna be talking to them about that at their next meeting, which is, um, what is today? I think it's June 23rd. Third, yes, June 23rd, we're going to be talking to the CRC about um, Article 14. And would this be the time to at least put in the record the, the two, two new members coming for planning board? Yes, of course. I'm sorry for not thinking about that. Um, yes, we're happy to have two new members that have been appointed. They were just appointed on Monday. Um, Bruce Coldham is a former planning board member. Um, he's an architect and he's been uh, around town and doing things with the town for a long time. He's currently a member of the local historic district commission and um, he is very interesting and active. And um, I think you'll enjoy working with him. And the other person is Karen Winter. I don't know a lot about Karen, but she's also a member of the local historic district commission. And I think she lives in the neighborhood west of Kendrick Park. Um, she was involved with um, 
the planning of the uh, playground at Kendrick Park, not in not as part of the working group, but she often spoke up at meetings and she um, was very interested in that. So I think she's she's really interested in planning and um, you'll meet her. Those of you who haven't met her yet, I'll meet her on the 20th. OK, thank you. Um, report of the chair. I have no report. Report of staff, Chris. I don't think I have a report. <laughs> what time okay. is it? It's 10 18. No, report I don't. Report is it's 10 18 and it's time to adjourn. <laughs> okay. All right. In that case, it's 10 18 and let's adjourn. Thank, um, thank you. Thank you all for. Well, it's Jack's last meeting, so I'd like to thank him for his oh, yeah. many years yeah. of service. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah. say goodbye, everyone. Oh, <laughs> I have, I have some you. More. You know, I, I, I won't be gone. Obviously, I'm on some other things. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate we'll working. Miss, we'll miss your sunflower, Jack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have some new ones. I have a new crop this year. So I, I uh, we'll see if I can improve on the photo. So. <laughs> And All your right. sunny personality. We'll miss that too. Mm -hmm. oh, right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. And then I thought, oh, oh, I should probably stop.